It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour with... No! Mixed Martial Arts Hour is back in your life on this Wednesday, September 22nd, 2021. Hello again, everyone. Hope you're doing well. I'm just going to pretend that none of that happened. And if you're watching this after the fact, you won't know that we're starting the show 29 minutes late. You won't know. No one will know. No one will ever know. Um, I apologize for the delay. A uh, bit of a technical issue. I am told that we are good now. Uh, first time we've had an issue like this in the uh, the new era. Like I said, they used to be a staple of the old show, but uh, no longer the case these days. And so, like the great Gus Johnson once said, these things happen in MMA. And so these things happen on the MMA hour as well. Uh, I apologize to Lauren Murphy. We couldn't get to her, but the good news is she's a mensch. She has a busy day, but she will come on at 3.30. So after our last guest of the day, uh, she will come on and she will be the last guest of the day. So the person who was supposed to be the first guest is now going to be the last guest. Um, in a matter of seconds, we're going to be joined by Alexander Rakich. We'll also be joined by Action Bronson later today to talk about his amazing weight loss journey and his love of mixed martial arts. We shall talk to Mark Coleman, the legend, the first ever UFC heavyweight champion. We shall talk to Richard Schaefer. We're going to take your questions uh, after Lauren Murphy at 3.30, who, of course, meets Valentina Shevchenko. We'll answer those questions. You can leave questions right now on my Substack, arielhawani.substack.com, uh, and I'll answer those in our uh, very popular On the Nose segment. And we'll also get uh, Connor's betting picks for UFC 266. We teased this. I gave him the homework on Monday, and so he's back, and he tells me he's got some hot picks for this Saturday's card. So now we're kind of back on track. It's 1.30. This is when Alexander was supposed to join us. And so with one eye closed and one eye open, I say let's go back to the Zoom machine and say hello to one of the best light heavyweights on the planet. Joining us from Vienna, the one and only Alexander Rakic. How are you, sir? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm doing good. How are you, man? I'm doing great. We had some technical difficulties at the beginning of the show, so I was afraid that I couldn't hear you. Uh, but I could hear you, and I think we're all good. And so we, we shall start the show with you. Okay. By the way, Rakic or Rakic? What do you prefer? Rakic. Rakic. Okay. I guess that's the Canadian yes. in me. Like I say avocado, avocado, pasta, pasta, pa but Rakic. Yeah. So I apologize. for Rakic. That. Yeah. No problem at all. Uh, I get used to this, you know? Yes. So many guys are saying Rakic, 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 Rakic. I'm getting used to this. This is a little bit hard, you know, especially for in the other, you know, Americans and 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 Can Canadians or Brazilians. They just I'm getting used to this. They call good. my name a little bit different. I like to say <laughs> people's name uh, the right way, and I'm a big stickler for thank this. Thank you, man. So, so thank you for uh, correcting me. So we have a lot to talk about, my friend. Uh, you were in the news over the last few days. Uh, we're watching the Anthony Smith fight on Saturday night. Great performance. He beats Ryan Spann. He looks great. Uh, he finishes him in the first round. There's levels to this. He's all fired up afterwards. And uh, he says uh, that he wants to fight you afterwards. He says that in the cage, that he wants a rematch against you. And you tweet out right away, uh, I'm, uh, I'm good to go in December, or something like that. And then he responds, Merry Christmas to me. And so let me ask you, is this fight happening in December? And I say Santa is coming. <laughs> uh I'm I'm still waiting, you know. First of all, nobody was calling me out. Nobody, excepting Smith. And he has my respect of this. Yeah, like you said, he had an amazing fight on Saturday. He came in off a, a three-winning streak after our fight. But Mr. Smith, be careful what you wish for. Uh, you know, if the UFC wants the rematch, it needs to be a UFC main event. December 18, and after this, I'm gonna get my title shot. Oh, so this is this is what I want. The Smith rematch is not a problem for me. I can uh, dominate everybody in the division, you know, and beat everybody. So, 
you know, I respect him as a fighter. He did a great job. He made his improve. He, he improved a lot after our last fight. He came in very aggressively. Uh, but, you know, calling me out, he's the, basically the first guy, was something new for me, and I, I was right on it, you know. So, yeah, you know, sometimes I felt a little bit like Usman, Kamar Usman, before he was champion, because nobody was calling him out, you know. Yeah. And after he beat Tyron Woodley, they, uh, first of all, they, they say like, yeah, he can go on decisions. He's, he's a boring fighter. Uh, and then he beat uh, Woodley and he, gave, he, he became then champion. Then he's, he's taking all the heads off. You know, now everybody's respecting him. And I will do this soon. You know, I will do this soon. And Smith will be in December the first one. Okay, so a, a few things to say there. Um, number one, why December 18th? Is there something about that date that you really like? What, why are you picking that date? I mean, he, uh, I mean, I wanted December. Why not, you know, to close the show, uh, to close the year, you know? I think this should be the, the last uh, event in, in the year. Mm -hmm. And I checked, the, I checked the card. There is no main event yet. And I think he's also ready to go. And he said already, Merry Christmas, you know, so it needs to be there, you know. Okay. And I'm saying Santa Claus is coming to um, give some presents. Now, I thought initially when I heard him uh, call you out, I thought, all right, obviously, uh, I understand why he would want to run it back with you. He lost the fight. He didn't like the way he looked. You're on a roll. You're getting up there in the rankings. But in my mind, I thought, all right, the light heavyweight title fight, the next one, is happening October 30th. And if you just look at the rankings, it's probably going to be Alexander against Yuri Prochaska to determine who the next contender will be. And then all this happens with you saying, I'm ready to go. Why aren't you fighting Yuri next? Look, I want to stay active, you know. Uh, I checked the rankings today and Smith went from six to four. He's now four. I'm three. Uh, I was calling Yuri out the last months, you know, he didn't respond, he didn't reply. He's probably the backup of Jan and Glover. So if this fight's finish, uh, it's another, I don't know how many months of, 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 of layoff, you know, for, for, for the champion who, 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 who going to win the fight, you know? So probably the UFC wants Yuri next for the title. So this takes another couple of months and I want to stay active, you know? So I, if I fight Smith now, it's a good fight, but I can nothing, I can, my, my position or my ranking is not, is not going to get better. Or I, if I fight any other lower opponents, uh, lower ranked opponents, sorry. Uh, but um, yeah, I want to stay active and man, Yuri has two fights and an immediately title shot. He gets so much hype and push from the UFC like many other many other guys, you know. Like How do you for feel example about that? Uh, I think you have seven fights, right, in the UFC? I have seven fights. He His has time two. will come. He has two fights and he gets a push and like like for example Chandler. I think he had one fight and then he fought immediately for the for the for the title, right? But this guy he don't even know how to speak English, right, proper. So I don't know why, but um, his time will come and he will be forgotten, you know, like many other guys, like Johnny Walker, Volkan Uzdemir, you know. They get also a big push from the UFC. They lost their fights. Nobody talks about them more for the title elimination. And they need to be build their uh, bank, their, their, their winning streak and everything else. So... The same with Yuri, you know, and he can sit and wait whoever, however he lo uh, be, uh, he can sit and wait forever if he wants. But after I finish the business with Smith, I don't know if this will be enough to sit around and wait for his title chance, you know. Were you told that he's the backup or that he is next for the title shot? Like, because I see on your Twitter, you've been calling him out. You've been saying that you want to fight him. So you or your management... Uh, have they been told anything by the UFC about why they're not making this fight or why he's not available? Yeah. 
I think the Jan and Glover fight was supposed to be on September 4. Yeah. And then they rescheduled the fight of October 30. So basically, Yuri was the backup of September 4 fight. And then after after they, they rescheduled the fight to October 30, nobody knew if, gonna, if, if, if they're going to be a backup. So I, I talked to the UFC and I calling him out. Okay, let's fight. Let's see who who gonna fight for next for the title. And the UFC said to me they're gonna offer him the fight. And two days later, I saw on the internet in the media he gonna be the backup again in October 30. So he didn't take the fight against me. He was willing to be the backup and to wait another six seven months. Man, come on, this this guy. He fights once a year or what and get a title shot. I know from the UFC, they like guys who are active, who want to fight, you know, and not to sit around long. Yeah, he's got uh, a great look and a few finishes, and he's an exciting fighter. But if I look at his two fights in the UFC, um, wins over Dominic Reyes and Volkan Ozdemir, two finishes, very impressive. And I compare the names to your last two names, Thiago Santos and Anthony Smith. I mean, it's pretty damn comparable right i mean okay so you didn't get a finish he did maybe that's the only thing that you could say in his favor to me it just makes the most amount of sense why don't you guys just fight to see who the number one contender is that's the part that i don't understand here i'm ready to go whenever i'm ready to go whenever the ufc said this i challenged him for the last two three months and i am already better than all of those guys, Jan, Glover, Yiri, I'm going to beat all of them. It's just a matter of time. I want to be the champion and I want to beat the best. And the best are in the UFC and we are in the rankings like so high in the top five. And I want to beat them all and show the world that I'm going to be the champion. So uh, I don't know why he's waiting and why he's uh, sitting around, you know. But, you know, if the, if the fight with Yiri doesn't happen, you know, Smith would be great, you know, to stay active and to show uh, the people and, and, and the UFC that I improve also uh, um, since our last fight. I had a hell of a camp, maybe a, a hell of a camp for Thiago Santos. So I beat this guy. This fight was not maybe the spectacular one, but it was an important win for me and over a dangerous guy. And don't forget... I'm my my career is pretty young. I'm only getting better uh, from camp to camp, and in between camps in the off season, I'm working my ass off to get better. So, yes, Smith improves improved after his after our fight, but I can say about myself that I improve even more. Do you harp a lot on the Volkan Ozdemir fight, the split decision? Because I know you know, or at least you think that you know you believe you won that fight, and do you, do you think a lot about? Man, if I would have gone to the nod in that one, I'd probably be fighting for the belt already, or I wouldn't be have to deal with all this, you know, this uh, this nonsense, these headaches. Do you think about that a lot? No, exactly. Uh, to be honest, no, because for me, this this fight is a win. So <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see it like a loss. You know, it's lo and the loss on the paper. You need to risk uh, to, to rewatch the fight, and and even the UFC. You know, after the Volkan fight, they gave me Smith for the next opponent. A guy who beat Volkan, a guy who is better ranked than Volkan, and I beat him pretty easy. Uh, so it could be like, I like I like to build myself. I have like seven fights in the UFC. And if the, if the UFC wants another fight before to get me a title uh, shot, I'm gonna do it, you know? I'm not here to, to take my easy way and to, 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 to come to be champion and in the next fight to lose the, to, to lose the belt, you know? I'm here to getting better and after every fight I improve, you know, and I'm growing as a fighter and I want to be champion. And I told you in a white as well, I'm going to be the new face from the light heavyweight division because I have a great, a, a hell of a team. And, you know, the first thing when uh, Smith said my name in the, in the, in the, in the post-fight interview, my coaches was already talking, hey, maybe we're going to fight him. Okay, we're going to do that. We're going to do this. We're going to change that. We're going to do this, you know. They're already thinking, you know. They're already, like, for me, starts the camp immediately. If someone calling me out and the UFC wants the fight, you know, doesn't matter if three months or, or six months. We start the camp immediately and we, we, we you know, we, we try to 
to be even better in the in the in, like in the first fight with Smith, you know. Uh, when you watch Anthony, uh, since you fought him last three fights, he's looked very good. Three great performances. Do you think he has improved? exponentially do you think he has improved a lot or perhaps is he fighting guys who just aren't as good as you what's your take on it both of them you know he's he improved but with all the respect with all the respect these guys who he beats they're not in my level you know they're not in i'm in the martial arts like 16 years now i i, I faced so many different fighters you know so and I'm I'm living this, you know. This is everything to me, this sport. So yes, he improved. Uh, uh, like the second fight, he won by like a calf kick, right? You know what I did to him with the calf kick. So I think he took this, you know, or maybe, you know, he 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 realized, okay, this shit works, you know. But he's a he's a he's a he's a he's a He's an experienced guy. He's uh, the most fights in the in the. He has the most fights in the in the rankings in the light heavyweight division, I think. So, yeah, he improves. He's more aggressive right now. And if the fight happened, I expecting a more aggressive uh, Anthony Smith. But man, I can just say Santa Claus is coming in December. Uh, and <laughs> and and for you, I mean, like historically. When it's a non-title fight, they don't run it back this quickly. You know, when it's two guys who are kind of, you know, historically, you'll fight again if it's, you know, a guy loses the belt and they want to rematch something, but not these types of fights. Are you, you know, do you feel like you might have a hard time getting motivated for, for a fight where you beat the guy a year ago? You know, it wasn't that long, it was one fight ago that you fought him. Uh, this isn't usually something that someone in your spot has to deal with. You beat a guy rather convincingly, and then a year later, you have to run it back. Yes, I know he's on the winning streak, but again, unique situation. Will it be hard to be motivated for this one since you already climbed that mountain a year ago? Yeah. No, no, for example, no. I see if the UFC wants that fight, and if we're going to fight, I see Anthony as a new opponent, and I'm not going to underestimate him. Uh, for me, it's a new opponent, but I already feel, felt him. So I am motivated 24-7, 365 di uh, days a, a, in a year. So whoever they're going to put in front of me. Of course, Yiri would be the, the, the best option for me because after I beat his ass, I'm going to go get for the title. But if it's not Yiri, if the UFC wants Smith, I'm not, I never have problems with motivation and to get back to the gym and, and train, you know. Like I said, in the off season, I work in my ass sometimes even harder than in the camps. So yeah, my goal is to get imp to 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 improve and to get better and to put you know the outcome of the fight to be to be even better. And in the first w fight with Smith, I made one mistake. I didn't finish him. So if that happened, the fight, I'm gonna finish him. And uh, since this happened on Saturday, any discussions? I mean. Usually when two guys say, hey, I want to fight each other and they're, they're big names in the division, highly ranked, they usually try to make the fight. Any discussions about making the fight for December? Yeah, yeah. my management is talking to the UFC. So I'm still on it. I'm still waiting for the call. And we're going to see what happens. You know, I'm already start my training camp. So like like a kind of camp. Yeah. Uh, can I make adjustments, you know? So, and my, my, my camp and my coaches are already studying every opponent, potentially opponent like Yiri, Jan, Glover, also Smith. Now we study Smith a lot, you know, before the first fight, but still there is always some, some things to see new. So we study them all and yeah, it's just a matter of time when the news are coming. So I'm going to be prepared for sure. Who do you think wins next month between Glover and Jan? I think Jan, Jan Blachowicz is going to uh, be the champion and still. Really? I you know. I respect Glover. He has a, he has a experience. He has an iron chin. His grappling is good. His boxing is good. But um, Jan had an amazing fight last fight. We fought on the same card against Israel. He improved as well as a champion. He grown, you know. So I think he's in his prime. So... 
I think Jan going to win for sure. Are you hoping that he wins because now he's on a roll? You want to be the guy to beat him next, or you don't really care about that sort of, of thing? Of course, I'm always I'm always with the European fighters. You know, I'm always with them because the U, the MMA is in Europe not not so big like like in 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 the US. So I'm always for rooting for the for the European fighters, and we are now three Europeans in the top five. So that's that's big for European MMA, and of course. I would love to to fight him and to take the t- take the belt from him because he's a great champion. He made good fights, and he's a hard worker, and I respect that. Uh, how, but if the fights are coming, it's no respect. You know, I could go in and knock him out, knock him out, or finish him. Doesn't matter. How's uh how's training? How's life there in Vienna now with the pandemic? Are you able to to do whatever you can, or is it um is it <clears> very strict? Yeah, I mean. It was in the summer was a little bit lighter. Now the the restrictions getting a little bit uh, uh, more. So, I'm basically you can do do uh, you can I can train I can work you know I can do everything what what I need to live. So everything is open, and I, I think they're not gonna do a lockdown again. So many many people are vaccinated there. Uh, yeah, but. They're searching, you know, if you want to go for a restaurant or somewhere else, you need to have a test or get vaccinated. So, yeah, it's a it's a it's a different situation. We never faced this situation before. So, but we get used to this. Yes, and you're in Vienna now, right? Yes, I'm in I'm I'm in Vienna, Austria, right now. Yeah, starting to get more attention, more media, more love. Uh, yeah, I mean. It's pretty hard, you know, to to let the people know MMA is a sport and not just a, a street fight, you know. Uh, but I'm getting there, you know. I'm a, a good ambassador, you know, for Austria and for for Serbia, the whole Balkan. And my goal is to to make MMA even more popular here and in the future to bring the UFC here. That would be great. Yes, when when the world opens up again, that would be a great spot. Uh, yes. I've never been to Vienna. I, I hear it's uh, beautiful, beautiful. I hear Austria is a beautiful uh, country as well. I'd love to go one of these days. I hear such great things about it. I know you're a big MMA fan, um, Alexander, as well. What do you think about the return of Nick Diaz this weekend? Will you be staying up to watch that? Of course. I'm going to be on Twitter live. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, it's it's nice. You know, It's he gets he has all the respect. You know, he had he achieved many good things in the in the MMA in the MMA world. So it was a long, long layoff for him, right? For five, five, six years, yeah. I think. So, and Robbie Lawler is just a, a great opponent for him, you know, and a great fighter. It's going to be fireworks. I'm very hyped of this, and uh, I'm looking forward. It's it's good. It's good to see the the Diaz the Diaz brothers in the octagon, you know. Absolutely. So to recap, uh, you are down to fight Anthony Smith. You're putting it out there. You want it to be December 18th, main event. If they come with co-main event, you say no. Take a hike, right? You want main event. You want five rounds with this I guy, right? I want the main event. I want I want the main event, you know, before. This is very important for me. And look, just the other thing is uh, me and Smith uh, were uh, the main event in our first fight, right? Yeah. It was supposed to be the co-main event and then the main event, right? So there was asking – my management was asking – us, um, me and, and the UFC are this going to be a five round fight or three round fight and we agree to five rounds but I think the other um, Smith's corner or Smith said uh, he don't want the five round fight because I understand he had so many uh, main events, he don't want to feel the pressure, he don't want to feel another two rounds you know, but it must be a main event fight you know, I want the main event, a five round fight your main so, event fight. I'm getting ready already. I'm building. I'm building a base, a conditioning base for five rounds. Now we are now getting into it, and my all other fights, you know, for the title, title and the title defenders are all five rounds, and it, I know I, it. It could go five rounds, so I want that main event. I'd imagine this time next year, back end of 2022, you believe you'll you'll be UFC champion. Absolutely, the, the belt will be here. Right? I look forward yeah. to that. And then we're going to we talk again. I look forward to that, my friend. <laughs> Maybe probably before as well, uh, before also, but yes. with the belt here, we're going to talk. Remember I, my words. I will remember that very much. Uh, thank you so much for the time, Alexander. Uh, good luck to you. 
I hope you get the fight. I hope you fight again in, in uh, 2021 against anyone, but that would be a fun story as well. And uh, thank you for coming on. I appreciate my best to everyone in Vienna as well. Thank you, man. Thank you. All the best to you. All right. There he is, Alexander Rakic, uh, a great young man who is doing great things in the UFC. Uh, two o'clock will be joined by Action Bronson, so have no fear. 29 years young, uh, the Rocket, very active on social media, big wins in the UFC over Tiago Santos, Anthony Smith, Jimmy Manoa, Devin Clark, Justin Ledette, and uh, had that split decision loss against one Vulcan o Ozdemir. So that one looms large, and perhaps part of the reason why he's not getting that shot. But also, you know, Yuri's got a lot of buzz surrounding him right now. Two fights in the UFC, but two finishes. A massive finishing streak. I mean, dating back to his draw in 2014, every fight since then has ended via KO or TKO. He's got a great look. We know about the hair and everything, and he's got those two amazing wins over Volkan Ozdemir last July and uh, the Dominic Reyes win in May of this past year, that spinning back elbow. And so it seems as though he is uh, on track to be the backup fighter for that title fight per Alexander. And uh, if all goes well, hopefully with that title fight, then he will fight for the belt. And so, like I said, uh, historically, they don't run those types of fights back between two top contenders who just fought recently. But if you look at the rankings and you look at what Anthony Smith has done as of late and how good he has looked as of late and the call out and Alexander saying, yeah, sure, I'll do it. It kind of makes all the sense of the world. Book it. Easy. I'm sure the UFC matchmakers love that. Makes life very easy for them. Um, all right, so we'll uh, monitor that and see if it all comes to fruition. A couple things before we get to our next guest. I did mention the Diaz-Lawler fight. So I reported last night that Nick Diaz, Robbie Lawler 2, fight 17 years in the making. 209 months ago, they first fought at UFC 47. That fight was won by Nick Diaz, not Robbie Lawler, as other people have said. Nick Diaz won that fight um, back in 2004, not 2011 or 12. Uh, anyway, uh, they are now changing it from a welterweight fight to a middleweight fight. Um, this has been signed by Diaz. Uh, Dana White said at the Contender Series press conference that Lawler hasn't officially said yes. I'm told it's good to go. Listen, Lawler isn't the kind of guy who is going to, uh, you know, cause a ruckus. He's a fighter's fighter. Maybe not happy about this. Maybe he's had to cut weight. Uh, you know, I haven't been given a reason as to why the late change. But to me, you know, I have to be honest. What I'm really looking forward to today, and hopefully we get it, you know, I want to hear from Nick. We haven't heard from Nick. You know, I, I saw there was a picture of him sitting down next to Mike Tyson. That was just a photo op. There isn't a podcast coming out with those guys. And so, you know, here we are on Wednesday, long way to return on Saturday. And I said this earlier, I want to know if he's fighting because he wants to, because he has to, some other reason. You know, so, a lot has been said about Nick. He has said a lot about, you know, his life, um, about his feelings towards fighting, he has long felt conflicted about it. I'll never forget that press conference in Montreal after the GSP fight where he's talking about the IRS and all this stuff. Like, There's a lot there. And I would be lying if I didn't admit that a part of me is a little bit trepidatious about all this. Am I absolutely psyched to have him back? Yes. Am I absolutely excited to have him back? Yes. He's a legend. Everyone loves Nick Diaz. Everyone loves Nathan Diaz. Everyone loves what they represent, their style, any fan of the sport who's been watching for the last few years knows who Nathan is. And then the OG fans, of course, know who Nick is from the Strike Force days, from the Pride days, from the UFC days. I mean, just an absolute one of one. You know, if, if, if fighters were NFTs, Nick Diaz would be, you know, the most valuable NFT because he is truly a one of one. I just want to know, like, does he want to be here? Does he want to do this? Um, of course, now I want to know about the weight change as well, and I'm really curious to see if the line changes. I told you on Monday the line was even. Does does this make people think one way or the other? They have a history of fighting at 185 and 170. Both guys have fought at both weight classes, and I could uh, foresee a scenario where Diaz is just like, yo, I don't want to cut this weight. It's now becoming real. I don't want to cut this weight. I just want to hear why he's doing this. He hasn't talked to anyone, and I know a lot of people have said, oh, you know, 
Can you talk to, of course I've tried to talk to Nick. Everyone's tried to talk to Nick. He's not exactly the easiest guy to get unless you're right there, you know, face to face. And even when you are face to face, sometimes he doesn't want to talk to you. Trust me, I know. Uh, I, I've been, you know, covering Nick Diaz fights for quite a while. I remember one time, uh, it was uh, July of 2009. It was the CBS event in Stockton. We did the whole interview at the press conference, pre-fight press conference. He was fighting Thomas Denny, did the whole interview. And then at the end of the interview, he told me he didn't like the interview and that he wanted to do it again. And we did the whole interview again. And I had no problem with that. Very complex man, a complex character. I'll never forget that piece that I wrote after uh, he was suspended and he talked about you know, his feelings towards fighting. Um, that last line has stuck with me ever since then. This was uh, 2015, so this is before the the Nathan Connor fights. And he told me it was this whole long thing that we posted on MMAfighting.com. And uh, the end always stuck with me. And especially as I saw Nathan turn into the star that he turned into, I always wondered how Nick felt about it. Happy content, proud, conflicted, torn. This was the end. Quote, guys like Connor, who are going to make more money than me, can see how to do it, as well as negotiate what they want in their contract using a team and agency and lawyers instead of their crooked jujitsu trainer and coach. Keep that in mind. I will tell you something about that after. Who was my manager for the majority of my career, except for my last fight when I found the right agency on my own and signed with them. And I didn't even graduate the mother F in eighth grade. But in the end, I'm just upset. I can't be there for my brother right now since he's going to be fighting soon. He was going to be fighting uh, Michael Johnson in December of 2015. It's my bad. He even got into the sport and he gets his face kicked in and they don't even pay him. I got us in this. And if I don't make any money, I don't have any way to get us out. End quote. That's the burden that this man lived with. He felt responsible for getting his brother in the, the game. Now, his brother has made a lot of money, has become a superstar since then. The, the thing that I said to remember, after that came out, he wanted to clarify that him and his coach, Cesar Gracie, are in good standing. In fact, Cesar has been a big part of this camp. Um, his head coach, once again, uh, helped him with his contract and all that stuff. So they are on good terms. That was you know, an emotional time for him. He's not even with the agency that he talked about there anymore. That was Ballinger Group. Um, but the point is, on that, you know, this guy has always felt a little bit conflicted about fighting. I remember one time asking him, "Are you excited?" I think it was the Zaromskis fight, and uh, I asked him, "Are you excited about this upcoming fight?" Stupid question, lazy question, silly question, and he got mad at me for asking about it because he wasn't excited. He always felt weird about it. And so six years out of the game, and yes, I know I talked to him two years ago after the Masvidal-Nathan Diaz fight. Six years later, why is he coming back? What's the motivation? Is it because he wants to? Because he refound the love of the game? He got that itch again, that stuff that you hear about athletes? Or because he has to? Or because someone is making? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the answer to this question. Um, and so hopefully later today, you know, we get answers at media day or tomorrow. I don't think there's a press conference. I could be wrong. At some point, I'd love to hear from him. Um, I have great reverence and love for Nick Diaz. And I know we had the, you know, where I come from, people like you get slapped, all that. Like, the man's been good to me. He really has. Um, and he's been good to all of us. He, anyone who's in the media, he's been good to. Don't get it twisted. He's given us a lot. Um, and so I just hope that he's in a good spot. I hope that he's healthy. I hope that he is happy. I hope that he wants to do this for his own personal reasons and not because he has to do it. And I keep stressing that. And so that's why I feel weird. Like I see a lot of people celebrating this and getting excited. And I want to be the same way because like I said on Monday, these fights are few and far between these days, these special ones, especially with the legends. I just want to know, I, and like maybe it's selfish, but I, I, in my heart, in my head, I want to know that he's, he's okay with all this, that he's doing this for the right reasons. So it's an interesting time. I'm very curious to see how this plays out. I suspect uh, Lawler will agree to the fight at 185, and I suspect that if it's not agreed to at 185, th there might be a good chance that this fight doesn't happen. Like I, I don't know if this fight happens at 170, to be honest with you. It, I think it has to happen at 185 at this point. Um, 
So we'll see. Thank you to uh, Casey and our team telling me that Diaz is at the presser tomorrow. So I guess we'll hear from uh, Mr. Nick Diaz tomorrow at the presser. Uh, of course, Robbie Lawler should be there as well, hopefully not sleeping. Valentina Shevchenko, Lauren Murphy, who we'll hear from later in the program, and also the champ, uh, uh, Volkanovsky, Alexander Volkanovsky, and Brian Ortega. All right. Without further ado, let us go back to the Zoom machine and say hello to one of my favorite people on the planet, Mr. Bam Bam Baklava himself, the Renaissance man, the author, the rapper, the 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 chef, the 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 musician, uh, the host, oof, the workout oof, fiend, the jujitsu practitioner. Oof, I mean, what else oof, can I say about him? The Oakley spokesperson, the one and only <laughs> Action Bronson. How are you, my friend? I'm amazing, bro. How are you? We're unfiltered, we're live, we're uncensored, we're not shackled anymore. You could do whatever you want, my man. You could do whatever, you could say what you want, you could do what you want. We are not being bound by corporate America anymore. How do you feel about that? That makes me feel amazing. You were never to be bound. You're a free bird. You need to flap those wings, my brother. You need to flap those wings. I appreciate that. Now, I, right. I, I'm really appreciative of the fact that you've... Uh, you know, you've wedged us in between probably workout number six and seven of the day. Did you get, did you, did you carved out? How many times have you worked Bro, out today? How many times? I went, I did two, but I'm, you know, the thing is this, I'm an addict, just like people who do drugs, which I also do, but not heavy ones. And people who drink liquor, I don't really, I'm not really into that. But, you know, I have to, I have to stay on top of shit, man. I can't let it go or else I have to actually be over. I have to be crazy about it. It's just the way it is. What time did you wake up? I'm today? in AA right now for fat. No, <laughs> your own. That's time. what this is. Every time I do fucking crazy training, that's what I'm doing. I'm in a meeting. The training is unbelievable. It's inspirational. Uh, I feel like such a schlub every time I wake up at uh, 7 a.m. with my kids next to me, and you're already like I look at the timestamp of your story, and it says four hours ago, and you're in the car, and it's dark, and you're going. How? What time did you wake up today? Today, I didn't even wake up. I've just been up. Come on. I just took a couple of naps. I've, I've been on, I've been on uh, ice lattes lately. I'm just pounding them down and just getting to it. Now, is that healthy? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm using oat milk. Oh, I love oat I'm milk. using oat milk and a touch of honey. A touch. Okay. So what's the ice coffee? I feel great. Listen, I sleep. I sleep sufficiently. I sleep enough. I sleep five hours, six hours. I'm taking a nap here and there. So, you know, I just, I'm vitamined up. I feel good. I feel great. Now, you know, some of the workouts, like the Bulgarian bag, I love that one. Now, I don't personally do it. I like watching you do it. You know, I feel that's like- That's a phenomenal, that's a phenomenal workout, bro. Yeah, who teaches you these things? Do you just kind of, I feel like you kind of just figure it out on your own. Am I accurate in that assessment? You're very accurate in that assessment. I just, I see, I like obscure straw. I, I like obscure feats of strength. I like to swing the bag around. And also, th th it has some allure to me being from Bulgaria of that area. You know what I mean? Like, I'm, I know that area well. And I think that it's genius that they mimicked a lamb being tied up hoof and foot, <laughs> you know? And then you just throw it around. And that's it gives you a really, I mean, it's amazing. It's tremendous. You can do everything you need with it. I'm not even, you know, I'm just living. I'm just doing what I do, man. Uh, so earlier this uh, this summer, you okay? Everything all right? Yo, I'm, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. I'm verklempt with happiness. <laughs> because you're on the MMA Hour, first time. You've been on my other shows, but this is, 100%, this is different. This, this is, is phenomenal. I know. I love this. I, I spend so much time watching the show. It's, uh, to be honest, it's kind of like, when you meet Michael Jackson or something oh, like that, if I was to, if I had. Well, that's crazy. Uh, but I appreciate that. That's very nice of you. Uh, earlier this summer, I read your book. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, F it, I'll start tomorrow. Uh, what a great cover. I thought uh, you were uncensored, bro. Didn't you get a big pop when you said motherfucker the other day? I did, I did but in the actual title, doesn't it say F it? It doesn't say fuck it. Well, the well it's just fuck it. Okay. I'll start tomorrow because everyone, you know, like no one wants to start right now. Right. But sometimes you just got to start tomorrow or Monday. It's a lifestyle. For sure. It's a mentality. But here's the thing. Reading the book, you're big action Bronson in the book. You haven't even actually started. Like you're talking about the eating. So it was a fascinating. At this point, you're like a year into this metamorphosis. 
but it was a window into the guy almost pre pandemic who felt like his life was getting out of control. What I love so much, I was sitting, you know, in my backyard reading it and I was openly laughing at times. Now you're not even here to promote the book, but I was open because it felt like that. one it felt like one continuous thought. The whole book just felt like one long thought from you going in a bunch of different directions. It was. <laughs> and, but in, in a, why did you put out the book after the, in, my question is why did you put it out talking about, you know, the big action days when at this point that guy yeah. was a thing of the past, you know, at that, it almost became, it was almost outdated by the time it came out. You see what I'm saying? A hundred percent. Well, you know, it, it it made me look at myself, you know, all that self-reflection, telling these stories and all these stories of yesteryear of how I used to do this and how I used to do that. What the fuck am I doing? I'm not even living. So, I mean, finished it during the pandemic, like as soon as it hit. So that was weird. I don't know. It just happened that way. It just happened that way. And I just became inspired. And, you know, by the time it came out, I had already dropped a shit ton of weight. So kind of help. it helped. It wasn't intentional. I just got my shit together. And that was kind of like the catalyst. Like I said, you know, um, I've been fluctuating in weight my entire life. But this is the first time I, you know, I'm really, I'm sticking with it. This has to be forever. The highest was what? Highest weight? 380? Bro, that fucking picture you put up today was <laughs> mortifying. I, could, I can't believe that I was like having sex and like doing dance moves and performing for an hour. Who I can't. I was smoking so much, bro. You were with me. I can't even believe I was able to walk a couple of blocks. I was massive. You had to fucking roll me down the hill. No, man, you were great. We actually have some before pictures for those that uh, may not be familiar. That was it. wild. Yeah, that was amazing. Yeah, you, never, you, know, you don't realize my whole career. I'm fat. That's that's. I look back on everything. I was, I did everything huge, which is ill. Yeah, I mean, look at you there. That's amazing. Uh, that that picture that you're talking about that I uh, retweeted today that was November of 2019, so not that long ago, like less than two years ago. Uh, and how much yeah. do you weigh now? I'm like 248. Do you think you could get lower, or do you want to get lower? I don't know. I mean, I, of course I could, but um, I like where I'm at right now. I feel good with the things that I do. I feel strong. I just feel strong, and I'm sure, obviously there's there's things to be done, but you know I'm not drastically trying to go at it right now. I'm drastically training for everything in life. I train like I'm some sort of like I have something that to look forward to, a fight, the water, this that. I I don't know. I'm just I train for life. How do how do you have? I mean, you have intense motivation. I see you. You're going surfing one day. It's freaking winter. You're doing the workouts. I only. I've decided I'll only get in the water in the winter at this point. <laughs> Why? Why? I don't know. I just like it better. It's exhilarating. It makes me feel fucking amazing. But but my question is, how does someone have extreme motivation at this juncture when in the past you're letting yourself get that big? You're let, like, how could you well, go from having no obviously motivation? Obviously, I was motivated for other things. Okay. My motivation was bon vivant. Okay. You know, so it was like live as much as I can. And I definitely succeeded in that. <laughs> eating everything in sight and drinking everything in sight and doing everything that I wanted at any moment. Who cares if I needed the extension every time I had to get on the plane? It was worth it. You did, you did have I'm to get here. the extension. Of course. Was that embarrassing? Nah. Inside it was. On the inside it was. On the outside it was a smirk. But everyone knew I was hurting. Right. Uh, <laughs> I was actually just I was with my girl I was with my wife one time in Tulum in a taco spot and you know one those plastic chairs they're not made for a big ass and when you put two of them on interlocking on them and I didn't see that it becomes an un it's not a structure that's stable it's an unstable structure so we're in the taco spot everyone's eating tacos I just got the food I'm drinking boom I just fucking fall like straight back, do a roll. My underwear fall, like come <laughs> down. Um, you know, it was amazing. So, you know, you just got to laugh those things off. Just choke it up to a life, you know, a life well lived. Amen. Amen. Um, is there a moment that you can look back on and say this was the turning point? You looked at yourself, you felt something. Is there a singular moment? Yeah, there's always turning points. But this time it was... Uh, it was right when that pandemic started. 
Um, we're going to take a family trip to Colombia, and my, you know, my dog was going to go. And we needed to weigh the dog because it only fucking, for some reason, I had a weight limit for the dog. So whatever, we got the we got the scale, I got on it, I fucking was mortified. And then from that day forward, I didn't wait till Monday or tomorrow. I did that day. I just, I got on it. I got serious about, because I saw myself dying from food, which is fucked up. Right. The thing you That's love was up, killing man. you. Yeah. This has turned into Oprah. I love, I love it. I love this. I love. I, I was gonna say, I love this shit action. I love it, baby. Doctor Phil, that's it's so heartfelt, man. It's real shit. Because look, I watch, I watch mixed martial. Uh, I watch mixed martial arts nonstop for a whole for many many years. I want to fucking look like that. Right. This motivates me to be in shape and to watch these men and women go into battle and train hard. That's what I want to do. So I. Mimic that lifestyle and training. I I don't take days off. I go every day. I do two a days. I'm I'm fucking going hard. I'm intense. Well, I saw you in SoCal not that long ago, hanging with the man Cheeto Vera, uh, Orlando Sanchez, oh, yeah. I believe. Uh, it seemed like you were doing some jujitsu as well. Are we oh, active? He's a fucking animal. Yeah. <laughs> Orlando, fucking, he teaches rough. Yes. I loved it. He fucking like he does. He. He shows you how to crush. He crushes you. He crushes you. I love it. It's like boy. fucking. I mean, man, he showed me some move where we interlocked ribs somehow, and if I couldn't breathe any longer. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's like three twenty laying on top of you. It's like fucking. Let's get this. I love it. You have to train for life because someone could be laying on you like that. You know. What are you gonna do? So, uh, Die there? No, of course not. You, you're not going to tap out. Um, I saw that, and then I saw they put you in the uh, the EA UFC game as a playable character before Islam Makhachev. Oh my god! Before Giga Chikaze, <laughs> before so many crazy fighters, before Cheeto. Also, man, I felt weird. I was like, "Yo, dog, I'm sorry." And whoever gave me the rating of the four stars, DC, I'm knocking motherfuckers out left and right with. With leg kicks and high kicks and roundhouse kicks, axe kicks is kick is. <laughs> well, I know you're, you're you're very agile. I mean, I've seen you do cartwheels. People don't understand. They think just because you have the big frame, you're very bam bam Bigelow esque in that regard. I, I'm I'm much more I'm much more athletic than him. There's no doubt about it. Rest in peace. Right. But I have a good kick game from the bottom of you know like the calf to the hip. Okay. After that, it's over. And a good front kick, okay. like a push kick, Thai style. Right, right. Uh, Anderson Silva. I do. Style. I like a lot of Thai elbows. I'm in. I'm in tight headbutts. I'm not licensed. I don't have a license. I headbutt. Uh, I mean, that's old school style. And I forget <laughs> Mark Coleman, who's coming. I thought you would appreciate being on the same show as Mark Coleman because you're an old soul, right? I was going to mention Mark Coleman. Thank you. He's amazing. I like, you know, block. I mean, a lot. I hear a lot of people recently going to Blockbuster, like, yo, dog. Weren't in the snowstorm in New York City going for walking the blockbuster on Casino Boulevard. No, you know, that's why I was getting the fucking VHS tapes. We watched it live on the black box. Like I told you, my man, Ronnie Rango's father had had the, had the, the illegal cable, you know, early days. <laughs> but what I was wondering about was with the training and then they put you in the game. Is there and, and given your intense motivation? I feel like there's a part of you, correct me if I'm wrong, who's like, at one point I want to do, I want to have one match, one jujitsu competition, one amateur. F I feel like you have so, you, you have so much motivation. You have devoted yourself to this transformation that there's a part of you, the, the, the athlete in you that just wants to do it once, test yourself once. Am I crazy for thinking this? There's no doubt I love competition, but fighting more than likely not. Jiu-jitsu, if I get good enough, I would definitely take part. I would love that. Mm. I'm into I like mixing it up. I like grappling. I like fucking choking. I, you know, I like shit like that. I, you know, I don't, I don't think that mixing it up at this point, fighting, you know, that, that, that's not, that's not something I'm into. I like playing racquetball. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like riding the fucking bike on the bridge and running. I'm trying to do, I'm watching Felder and, Nick Diaz and Nate doing, you know, decathlons, and I want to do a run, swim, oh, man. fucking whatever the other one is, 
run, swim, uh, bike, fish. <laughs> yeah, bike. <laughs> um, okay, so <clears throat> I mean, it doesn't have to be a long one. I just want to run, swim, sure. and then do the other one in succession. If there's no pandemic, does this happen, or are you still 380 pounds? Yeah, I'm, I'm fucked. Who else probably go more? I was going on tour. It gets hectic on tour. Right. Now, not that long that, ago, yeah, no, Coney Island, you made your triumphant return. That was your first live show, right? The one in late August? Yeah, it was unbelievable. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. Hurricane Hurricane Tito. What was it? What was it called? Uh, was it not Ida? It was another one before that. Yeah, it was the one around SummerSlam weekend. Um I don't yeah. remember. But but here's my question. Physically, how did you feel? Because this was your first time testing it out with the new body, with the, the, the new mind. Did you feel a drastic difference from when you were performing weighing 350-something pounds? Um, you know, I had an uncanny ability to perform at that weight. Anybody who's seen me live, they could tell, like, I, I don't, I, I've never missed a beat, really, when I'm at that weight. But now it's just like, I used to jump in the crowd and shit like that. At this point, I could probably like hang off the rafters and do like pull-ups off the fucking balcony, but I'm not trying to do that anymore. No, no. I'm not trying, I'm not young and aspiring trying to wow the crowd. I'm just giving them my, I'm just giving them all of me. You know what I mean? I felt, I felt amazing on stage. New York City really showed out for me in the, in the, in the try. I was up against Springsteen live in the park for free. Damn. I had a sold out Coney Island amphitheater in, in the hurricane. I wasn't even expecting it. I was I was backstage swinging the clubs a little bit, getting warm. You know, I went out on stage with an indigenous Colombian purse that was given to me by my mother in law. A cut off shirt because I don't wear sleeves anymore. Also, that's a new thing. OK, every single shirt I have is cut every fucking shirt. Don't give me a shirt unless you want it cut up. Okay. So yeah. All right. I thought you were going good. Uh, Overall, when are we going back on tour? I'm doing a couple spot dates here and there. I'm gonna do Boston. I'm gonna do Philly because it's drivable. And then let's see how things move. I don't know. Next year, early next year. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. You, you did. I just want everyone else to feel ready. Right. I'm ready. You did make some time uh, to go to UFC 264 in uh, July. You were there. You saw Connor's leg break. That was gruesome stuff, sure right? Sure did. Man, it was fucking, it was gruesome. <laughs> but I didn't know what happened. I didn't realize that his leg broke immediately. I just thought he got knocked out. And then they showed the replay, and it was just like, oh, fuck. It was rough. But yeah, it was just me, my man Big Boy, and Mel Gibson for a while. That fuck. <laughs> Rocking the Patrick Ewing jersey with the black tape here. 97 that, style. Man. 97 style. Ooh, yeah. Now, uh, did you happen to see right. Con Conor McGregor's uh, ceremonial first pitch last night? I caught I caught a glimpse of it. I caught a glimpse of it. I feel like that was that's he could probably throw the ball better than that. That's fucking staged. <laughs> oh, come on. No, why would anyone stage that? It's one of the all time worst first nah, pitches that's ever. That's like wild thing, Ricky Vaughn right there. I mean fifty that's cent Ricky has Vaughan. fifty like cent. It. You ever see fifty cents? But listen, you don't expect fifty to know how to throw a ball. He sold drugs all his life. Right, right. Conor McGregor's a professional athlete. He should be, even if he, he probably throws tennis balls in training. You know what I mean? Fifty. What would Fifty Cent be doing with a baseball? Ah, you know, you're in your you're selling crack. Right. That's true. I I have never done the ceremonial. I'm not that big time, but I hear from the top of the mound it gets a little tricky. Have you ever done it? I feel like you probably you, you oh yeah you did it Whoa, at, listen, at the Mets game, yeah, right? When I fucking threw I threw the pitch out, but before I fucking go out on the mound. It's like she jinxed me. She goes, listen, do me a favor. Please don't step on the mound. I was like, what the fuck? They asked me not to step on the mound before I go out there. I was ready. Yeah. I'm, I'm money from second base, center field. We want to fucking put me in fucking Memorial Park, wherever. I'll go off, throw it off the Long Island Expressway. It doesn't matter. It's a strike no matter what. I got a cannon. I, I, I know. I was blessed with all kinds of things except height. Five eight five nine. I feel it was six. If I was closer to six, pro, NFL, anything, mm -hmm. javelin, 
um all right so uh i mean he's owned it and i think he did a, a good job of just owning you have to own it at that point um but yeah, it's good any any first pitch is good anytime you get to throw the ball out and it's, it's a good time it's it's a nice it's a nice little ceremony how, how are you feeling he had a suit on yeah you know, he had a tight. suit on i had stretchy shorts on so you know it's a little bit different my stretchy shorts gave me a little bit more room to get the leg kick how are you feeling about the the state of Connor's career? A lot of people have jumped off the bandwagon. Uh, he just has to win, you know. Like at this point, you just have to win. Just, you just go on a streak. You just can't keep losing. You got to win. What, there's really nothing more to say. The bandwagon people are always going to be there, you know. You got to fucking not even listen to those people. I'm, he's he doesn't need inspiration from anybody. You know what I mean? He's a grown ass man who's made grown ass money doing the thing he loves to do most. You don't have to fucking listen to nobody. He can stop right now and still be a legend forever. What about the return of Nick Diaz? How excited are you for this this Saturday? It's phenomenal, but did I when before he, while I was sitting here listening, I haven't checked all the all the all the news today. What the fuck is going on? He didn't make weight. No, I is mean, there a weight situation? Is he is he is he heavy? He's heavy right now. You know, he's always had a, a conflicted relationship with the weight cut, right? Um, his brother, too, you know, tries to make No one it. likes it. Who wants to? It sounds horrible. Yeah, it's horrible. So I think they just said, you know what? Let's just meet at 185. We both walk around at 185. I suspect it happened to 185. And honestly, if anyone... Is it a mutual thing? Uh, I think it's, if I'm being honest, I think it's more of a of a Diaz thing. But um, and I think Robbie Lawler needs to get on board. But he's not a stickler. Lawler's a fighter's fighter. He's not gonna. He'll just fight for real. Yeah, he'll yeah. fight. He's probably not thrilled the fact about that this it. is happening. I mean, the fact that this is happening years in the making, and then they get to do. I mean, when Robbie was coming up, and he gets stopped like that, and then years later to get the rematch. It's now they're in their latter years. It's it's interesting. It's a, this is a fun matchup. I can't wait to watch. I just hope it goes down now. I don't know. I'm worried. Mm. Is 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 I act- hate when matches get striked from fucking COVID or dumb shit or this or that. The fuck. You're always losing some sort of card these days. Yeah. It's hard to get excited it's annoying. until the fights actually happen. Why is Dan right? Hooker on the prelims though? Like what's that? Well, Hangman on the prelim? Yeah, well, how about the fact that he's still in New Zealand and this fight is happening on Saturday? I've done that before. I've I've landed immediately and done something immediately. It's not fun. And now his opponent is having visa problems, too, and he's in Frankfurt. The whole world is upside down. Can I ask you about Jake Paul? Are you a fan of the Jake Paul thing or, or not so much? I'm, I'm not really a fan of anything. I just think that it's, you know, I think it's dope. I think that it's cool that somebody that's out of nowhere just fucking started beating professional athletes up. It's pretty amazing. Okay. You know what I mean? And it's him. Because at the end of the day, it's like, I don't know where he comes from. It comes from YouTube, right? And yeah. and like fucking Disney. film and shit. Yeah. It's kind of fucking, it's kind of great. It's kind of great. It's fucking shit up. People are asking me to do shows about fighting and shit like that and fight camps and celebrity fighting. You know he's doing it. It's the hottest fad around. It's making the most money. He's fucking, he, he unlocked the key. Mm-hmm. He unlocked something. Um, speaking of unlocking, I was hoping to unlock this mystery. See, you see that segue? That's a professional segue right there. That's a I love it. Um, the book was great. It was very revealing. Again, it's called Fuck It, I'll Start Tomorrow. How about that? Two swear words That's in right. one interview. Um, but there was one thing you held out on us. Um, you held out on us uh, with regards to the toothbrush. You talked about a toothbrush, and then you said you couldn't tell us the story of the yeah. toothbrush. Are you willing to reveal the mystery behind this toothbrush? Yeah, I did I did some fucking, you know, I did something vengeful <laughs> to somebody's toothbrush. Let's just keep it that way. Oh, God. There was vengeance taking on somebody's toothbrush, and then I watched them use it. Oh my gosh! And are you are you yeah. ashamed of this this act or never? Okay, I'm never ashamed of anything. I've done it. It's part of me. It's it's woven into the fabric that is me. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Let's just say I brushed my asshole with it. 
Oh, Jesus. Okay, now you're just going to actually tell us. This was an enemy of yours? Well, no, I didn't. I'm joking. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, it seems pretty vengeful to do that. I mean, what's worse than that? Well, yeah, think about it. What could be worse? <laughs> <laughs> was this an enemy of yours? No. Just a friend? It was just a situation. Okay. Nah, nothing happened. I'm just fucking around. That's all shits and giggles. That's right. It's a great book, by the way. I hope I'm not making you uncomfortable yeah. when you're talking about this. Your relationship with... I'm not the, uncomfortable with anything. CC Sabathia, you guys working out with that big guy, Dave Fit. That guy's the man. He's got he's got yeah, the fireman man. showing up at the gym on 9-11, doing the Stairmaster thing. It's all very inspirational. That's stuff. his thing now. And yeah, then... It's beautiful. And then you are out there again. I, I watch everything. I, you know, DC tried to shame me in our relationship tried to make it seem like I'm the first one to like your post. Not true. You, you get like 50,000 likes in the first minute, DC. Whatever happened to that guy? Where's that guy? That's what friends do. We like yeah. each other's posts, That's even what... if we don't give a shit. Yeah, for sure. It's called support, DC. Where the hell are you? Exactly. Anyway, you go out there. You're like, yo, Oakley, I've been wearing your stuff for 15 years. Hook me up. And then you're in the freaking campaign and they hook you up, right? Yeah, you just got to speak up, man. You got to speak up. I was, you know, I just was like fucking sick of this shit. I'm sick of it. Yeah. I want in. I want my beak wet. That's right. I like Oakleys. I want to. I want to have my own. I want to create my own campaign. I fucking run. I do things in them. I swim. I want to create a pair that you could wear in the ocean because my eyes are so sensitive because of the lack of pigment. Because okay. they're so ocean blue. I saw you. Uh, you were uh, surfing with Ally Quinton. I think John Volante too, right? I didn't, but they went to the same place, and that oh. good buddy of theirs, Will, is is the dude who runs the spot. Okay, it's a Long Beach connection thing. If there's someone out there listening to this, watching this, uh, who's feeling out of shape, no desire, no will, what can you say to that person right now? On the couch, feeling down, feeling depressed, feeling mentally weak. What can you say to that person right now? I would say all kinds of things. I'd have to see them first so I could actually make a full assessment of their fucking disgustingness. <laughs> no, but you have, <laughs> you just need to get up and make the first move. You just got to move that ass. The first thing to do is just move. You got to move. Change your diet. Stop being disgusting. Live your life. You unlock so much more happiness when you're happy and when you feel good and you feel free and you feel loose. You know what I mean? Yeah, I love this because, you know, sometimes we get into the nitty gritty of all that stuff and um, of the sport, MMA. This to me is inspirational stuff. I'm sorry about your Yankees. My Blue Jays are coming in hot. Vladdy Guerrero, the man, the pride of Canada, not only Canada, but the Dominican Republic as well. I know you got love for the it's DR. Beautiful. Yankees are choking, but it's all good. We got the Knicks coming up next month. We got UFC 266. You're in the freaking video game. You're throwing a block Bro, party. Can you fucking believe that? How can, how ridiculous is that? It's incredible. And you saw that little thing I did. I brought in the monster rep. I really tried to make it like I was a real fighter and shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You and Hans chopping it up. Uh, you got a block party in Williamsburg this weekend, right? In, on Saturday. But yo, let me show some love to Hiran Grace. He also, oh, my man, evidence because Hiran, he showed we we trained a bunch also, and he took me to the to the Sand Hill in Manhattan Beach and kicked my ass. And I plan on meeting up with him again legend okay because i actually love that it's it's mind training body training like it's next level he's a good man he's a legend yes him and his brother uh Hiron and henner uh i was gonna say yep. you, you got the block party in williamsburg uh f that's delicious fuck that's delicious is on the youtube channel right. now uh, the Action Bronson yep. YouTube channel, you've gone independent as well. Uh, some might say you've taken inspiration from me. You went independent after you saw oh, yeah. I went independent. Uh, I'm trying to run down I'm all the my, I'm hitching my wagon. That's right. Is there anything you that I missed? What's up, bro? There's nothing. I've just come here to say what's up. That's it. And you fucking bombard me with a heartfelt <laughs> fucking thing over here. Now I'm going to go jump out the window with depression and, and no. embarrassment. You've inspired me. I'm trying to work out, too, a little bit more. Get mentally strong, and maybe it's one day, good. you know. I told you, I told you, I throw the Bulgarian bag around a little bit if you want. Much love, action. If, if I see DC uses the Bulgarian bag yes. at his academy, you know it's real shit when he's using it. 
My dream is one day you, me, and DC, we sit down, we have a nice little uh, bowl of Creole. You know, we, we have some, mm. uh, some Louisiana rice, you know, sans bacon for me or sausage. I don't eat the sausage, but we could figure out something else. You we'll know. use beef. Yeah, we'll yeah, use yeah. the beef sausage so you don't have to, you don't have to miss out on anything. Uh, much love, my friend. Great to talk to you. You're the man, my brother. Take care. You hear me? Thank you. And congratulations you. again. I love watching. I love dedicating fucking 20 hours of my entire week to you. <laughs> my fucking wife hates me. Everyone hates me. All I do is watch MMA talk. I'm watching it all. That's great. Let's go. Well, you were the one. Wait for the fights this weekend. When I moved away from doing the interviews, you said, I need my three hour shows back. And so I've done this just for you. I told you to do it every day. Yes, you did. <laughs> Come on. You did. Much love, action. Thank you so much for doing this. Man. Talk to you soon. Peace, brother. There he is. Peace. Bam, bam, baklava himself, the Renaissance man. Action Bronsolino. Look at that guy. Absolute inspiration. How could you not love him? Appreciate him coming on. Uh, I see this coming through the, uh, and definitely check out the book. If you want to laugh, if you want to learn about how he transformed, if you want to learn more about him, the book is phenomenal. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it anywhere. Uh, I saw this come through right here. Damon Martin, MMA fighting, as I predicted. Uh, Robbie Lo Oh, this is uh, from Media Day, I guess. Um, Lawler just rolled with the punches regarding the middleweight. I mean, I'm ready to go. That's all that matters. Camp went well and controlling the things I can't control. Yeah, we had a short conversation. It is what it is. I'm ready to fight. We're moving forward. Uh, I let Dave Martin do those things as manager. He consulted me and figured it out. I don't get into the nuts and bolts of that stuff. I know it's an interesting part of the sport, but I don't really discuss those things. There you go, Robbie Lawler. I'm just trying to stay calm. So yeah, it's going to happen 185. I told y'all. I told y'all it's going to happen at 185. Y'all didn't believe me. Y'all didn't believe me. When have I ever led you astray? When have I ever lied to you? Never. That's when. So we go from one big man legend to another. We go from An Action Bronson to the first ever UFC heavyweight champion, the godfather of ground and pound. You talk about legends. This man is a living legend. And, and I've been on this crusade as of late to educate you jabrones about the history of the sport, about the founding fathers of this sport, about the people who built this sport before it was cool to be an MMA fighter, before it was cool to be in the UFC, before it was cool to watch the UFC. These are the men that made this sport what it is today, and we must honor them. We must celebrate them. We must remember them. One of those people at the very top of the list is in Las Vegas right now for a whole host of reasons. He joins us now via the Magic of Zoom. He is the one and only Mark Coleman. There he is. Mark, how are you? I'm doing great. Never been better. How are you, Ariel? I'm doing great. It's great to talk to you. Congratulations to you and the team. Your guy, A.J. Dobson, with the big win last night. What did you think of his performance? Yes. Yes. Wow. That's uh, truly amazing. He's uh, he got so much talent. Uh, he, he, I'm out here for uh, Kevin Randleman's Hall of Fame. Uh, he reminds me so much of Kevin as far as his athletic ability, um, working on his mind, strengthening his mind. But hey, there, there's nothing because nowhere he can't go. This guy really, really has the potential to be a champion. It's crazy because I saw a, a photo of you guys in the locker room yesterday. I think we have the photo right over here. Uh, you're watching uh, AJ jump up, and it looks exactly like Randleman. It's crazy. Yeah. Like your old friend Kevin. Yeah, Are you thinking that as well? Yeah, yeah, I was. I told him he might want to have to start doing that for a little intimidation factor because uh, whenever Kevin did them three jumps before the fight or before a wrestling match, uh, I, you could just see the other guys uh, piss his pants or whatever. It's very intimidating, and, and I, I think he might actually be getting higher than Kevin did. I don't know. Yeah. It's pretty man. amazing. This guy is, uh, talent-wise, he's second to none. Um, just going to work on his mind, get him stronger, and uh, make him believe how great he really is. Yeah, uh, if he starts bleaching his hair, then all bets are off. Then he'll be the second coming of the monster, Kevin Randleman. And and it's unbelievable the way these stars are aligning for you to be there with someone who fights and uh, you know and 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 and, and, and you know performs like Kevin Randleman. And then, as you said on Thursday, uh, your old friend Kevin Randleman will finally. Be inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame. You're going to be taking part in that ceremony, which is very much apropos. What is it like for you to be there? And unfortunately, he is not with us anymore, and so he can't celebrate this this uh, this milestone, uh, this great accomplishment. 
I, I just feel so blessed to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm just so, so at peace these days. I, I found peace and, uh, uh, just, you know, Dana White made it happen. He flew me in for the whole week, uh, got me there for AJ being AJ's corner and he's bringing me in for, uh, Kevin's, uh, induction. And, um, uh, I miss the guy always, but, you know, I had a long talk with his wife, Elizabeth, and then we're, we're going to, we're, we're celebrating his life. We're not going to be sad about this. Uh, um, you know, things happen. And, um, I was just, uh, I was blessed to, to be able to spend 30 years of my life with that guy. And, uh, we did everything together. I mean, he was a very, very special man. He touched so many people's hearts. Uh, I, I, he, I knew he touched people's hearts, but he, I found out more since he's been gone. I, I so many, so many fan pages for Kevin Randleman. Uh, just uh, so much love for the guy. He he really, really loved people. He really touched people's hearts. You say that you found peace these days, Mark. Um, are you referring to your sobriety? Yes, I am. How many days? Uh, 100, 155 days today, and uh, I've never felt better in my life. Uh, uh, I've, I had, um, five months ago today, I, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to do this. I wouldn't be able to do the induction. Um, i really hit rock bottom. I mean, you can always go a little lower, but I'm going to call this my rock bottom. I'm never going back there again. And, uh, thank God I had my, my good friend, Wes Sims who came and, uh, basically he shoved me into the rehab center in, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, see Chris rehab center. And, uh, it's probably the best choice. Not probably it is the best choice I've ever made in my life to go there and seek help because, um, I realized, um, you can't do it alone. I, I needed help and, uh, all of us need help. We're all in this together and there's a lot of us out there and, and I'm going to, uh, my doors open for anybody that wants help because I, um, I see what it did for me. It's changed my life, changed my life for the better. And uh, I'm really just so happy these days. Now, is, is this around the same time that you had the heart attack? Well, the heart attack was like uh, probably almost a year ago now. So I had the heart attack. And, uh, um, you know, I took, a, I, I, I took a couple of days off to, you know, kind of act like I was going to try to make some changes, but uh, I wasn't ready to make some changes, I guess, because it didn't slow me down. Uh, within a couple of days, I was back to drinking and, and smoking and drinking and, and just didn't care, man. I just really just didn't care. I didn't care anymore. I was very, very depressed. I don't know why I just was, but um, that was about a year ago. And then finally, uh, like I said, West Sims knocked on my door. He come, he come knocking on my door and he seen that I was a mess. And, uh, he had the balls. He had the courage to shove me, shove me into the rehab place. I didn't think it was going to be able to help me out, but within a couple of weeks, I knew I was in the right place. And, uh, it's just really changed my life for the better. Correct me if I'm wrong. That heart attack, that was serious stuff, right? I mean, uh, I, I remember that post that you put up of you in the, in the, the hospital bed. Um, I think you had a blocked artery, right? And they were saying that it was pretty serious, correct? Yeah, it was real serious. It was a, uh, it was a hundred percent clogged. Um, very close to. They finally was able to punch a little hole through it to get it flowing again, but uh, they was very close to 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 quit giving up on punching it through and um, would have had to have open heart surgery, but. Um, Thank God they uh, they punched through it, and uh, just thank God I, I clean my life up now. So because uh, I definitely want to be around, I definitely want to live. Um, if you don't mind me asking, Mark, you, you said that you were feeling very down. Why, why were you feeling so down? Um, it, it, a combination of things, man. The COVID the COVID virus didn't help matters. Uh, it it kind of it kind of gave me a. a I, I kind of thought I even liked it because we were all locked down and uh, I was locked down in my, my, uh, I was staying in an extended stay hotel and uh, nobody bothered me. So I, a lot of, a lot of times uh, alcoholics, we seclude ourselves and uh, that's exactly what I was doing. I, I liked seclusion. I liked being alone. As long as my fridge was full, uh, I was fine. And uh, that's all I really cared about is uh, 
getting my next drink. Uh, there, there was some other things that, that, uh, were weighing on me heavily, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm right in the middle of a sexual harassment lawsuit right now, which has been really weighing on me heavily. Um, split up with, uh, the ex-wife, which, uh, was a very toxic relationship. Um, but I got through it, man. I survived and I'm here today. I'm, I'm better than ever right now. I'm very glad to hear that. Um, yes, last year, the great writer John Wertheim of Sports Illustrated wrote um, just an absolutely eye-opening piece, uh, a very revealing piece about this uh, Oklahoma State uh, sex Ohio scandal. Ohio State, brother. Oh, gosh. I'm Ohio. Think- Ohio State. I'm thinking of uh, Daniel Cormier. No, Cormia. don't get those mixed up. Yes, of course. Ohio State. <laughs> My apologies. My my sincerest apologies. It's all right. We were just talking about D.C. Uh, with action, so I was thinking of OSU. Um, Ohio State. And uh, I have yeah. to be honest with you, uh, Mark, uh, I didn't know any of this. And, and I even feel till this day, correct me if you feel otherwise, uh, I feel like this doesn't get the same kind of attention as other. I'm not trying to diminish any other scandal or any other case, but, you know, I was one one stat that is, it's about a doctor named Dr. Richard Strauss, uh, who was a very prominent figure at the school for many years, I believe uh, like three decades. One stat that jumped out at me from the piece, I'm taking this from the piece, according to a report commissioned by Ohio State, before he was done, Richard Strauss committed at least 1,429 instances of fondling and 47 instances of rape. I mean, that is just astounding. Um, and my understanding is that you were victimized by him as well, correct? Yeah, yes, I was. Um, um, at first, uh, me, me and uh, Mike Sabato, we, we, we were the ones that came out, blew the whistle on the whole thing because we had been watching. I had been watching the uh, Larry Nasser um, gymnastic sexual harassment lawsuit, and um, you know, I just kind of started thinking about what happened to us, you know, twenty years earlier, and we didn't, we, we didn't. We, we joked about it mainly. We, we joked about it because we just didn't think uh, it was possible for a man on male athlete situation. We just, just didn't think that was possible, but then realized now we realize it is possible and it did happen. And we took a lot of abuse, man. We took a lot of heat. I took a lot of heat for coming out and saying this. Everybody thought for sure we were just trying for a damn money grab. How could this happen to a, you know, big ass Mark Coleman? How can this happen? Well, it, it did, you know, and, um, um, I wanted to be a national champion, you know, that's all I knew. And I, I wasn't going, I didn't even know how to stir shit up. And it, you know, we're dealing with Ohio State University, you know, we're talking about the biggest business, one of the biggest business in, 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 the, in America. And uh, they're doing a hell of a job of just covering it up. But it, it's getting some attention. We need more attention to it. Uh, right now, we just found out that the judge presiding over this, um, Hell, who knows? He he's he his wife works for Ohio State, and uh, he didn't disclose none of this. So right now, the the it, it's in the judge's hands. He may he may have to step down, and we have to make start over all again. And and um, it, you know, it, I I just really want it to be over with. It, it, it but but I'm glad I found peace because uh, it's it's been a long time. Why do you feel like this isn't being talked about as much? Well, it's it's man on man. It's not not a man on a woman. So man on man, people don't think it can happen. Uh, look at Michigan State. Look at Penn State. You know they're in the middle of big lawsuits. This happens all over the place. People just don't realize it, and now it's finally coming coming to a head, coming to attention. And then again, uh, we're dealing with Ohio State University, the Ohio State University, a very big university, and they uh, they wanna. They want this thing just to be ending and cover up, but they're they're not doing. They've admitted that they were wrong. Ohio State has admitted that they were wrong, but they're really not stepping up to the plate and and, and taking care of it. Have they tried to end this? Have they tried to reach out to you and and just sweep this under the rug? Yeah, I, I think they they've tried to end it with by sweeping it under the rug, and then and, and you know where we we. I have the right to want compensated for this. It's not no damn money grab. I have a right to, to be compensated for what happened to me and what happened to all my friends. I, I've had a lot of guys that I was coaching back in the day, really, really good wrestlers, really good athletes. And next thing you know, they just, uh, they quit the team. You know, they quit the team and, and well, basically we, uh, we called them a, you know, 
bunch of cowards, you know, quitters, this and that. We, but we had no idea why. It turns out now, 20 years later, these guys quit because they didn't want to have to go in and see this freaking doctor. And uh, it's just been a mess. Been a mess. And Ohio State, they need to be accountable for what they did. And uh, they're, they're not really stepping up to the plate. They want to wash it under the rug as best they can. I, I can't imagine what you and your friends and your, your teammates went through throughout your life afterwards, after leaving OSU and, and having a great fighting career and everything. How much of a burden has this been, has this, 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 this horrible experience been on your shoulders? Were you able, were you successful in trying to suppress it as you were climbing the ranks in the UFC and in your fighting career as well? Or do you feel like it was always something eating you up inside that at some point you felt like you had to tell the world about this? Yeah, I, I thought I suppressed it. I thought I suppressed it pretty good, but I look back, I look back at the things I did over the last 20 years, and uh, they weren't all good. I'm not proud of some of the things I did. I was angry, I was mean, I was feisty, and uh, I, I would have to guess that, that it had something to do with it. And then um, some guys didn't suppress it. Um, we're finding out how, how how bad it really was on some guys, and then I just blocked it away. Maybe who knows? You know, maybe there's no excuse for me drinking but uh maybe that is why i drank to, to block it all out and everything but um now at the same time um it's a second wave of trauma now because 20 years later we're, we're going through this it's been three years we're trying to get some kind of uh clarification on what's going to happen with this and it, it's just been it, it's it's resurfaced all the pain you know again and it, it's just really i just really want it to be over mm. but it looks like it's going to be drug out even longer now with this judge situation. Right. And, and just the last thing on this, if the judge has to be removed, like how far into the case were you guys and, and how much time does that now add into this process? If you have to start over, uh, we were three, we were three years into it. We uh, were, we thought we were pretty much done. Wait, wait for uh they, they, they offered a settlement and then they basically said, take it or leave it. And, uh, really a, it was uh, peanuts compared to what, uh, the, the gymnast got it was nothing i mean nothing at all so yeah we have a right to to want what we kind of feel we deserve for what happened to us all mark on this show over the last few weeks i've been talking about the legends of the sport guys like you guys like rampage jackson who was on my sport recently a a, a fighter who just retired carlos condit and and i have to say and i'm not trying to be dramatic about this mark but i feel like mma um more so than any other sport does a really bad job of honoring its legends. You know, you watch the World Series and all the greats come out before game one. You watch the NBA Finals and there's Bill Russell and stuff. And I feel like we don't do this enough in, in MMA. And I'm not, you know, I know you and Dana have a great relationship in this, but in general, I feel like you guys give us such great entertainment. You put your bodies on the line, your minds on the line, you sacrifice so much, and then your career is over and you're just kind of forgotten about. And that bothers me. I know that your friend Kevin Randleman is going into the UFC Hall of Fame, but there should be an independent MMA Hall of Fame where all of you guys are celebrated, not just for your UFC accomplishments, but for everything that you guys did from beginning to end with artifacts where you could take your children, where you could be celebrated like the boxers and the baseball players. Do you share my sentiment, Mark, or do you feel like you guys are being taken care of? How do you feel? Should I shut up? Should I stop talking about this? How do you feel? No, I mean, you're fine. And I appreciate people like you, but me personally, um, you know, just coming from that wrestling background where, uh, you know, we, we did everything, you know, for a fake gold medal. You know, we call it a yellow medal. We did it all for, for, for our own self-satisfaction, and we didn't get nothing. We jammed four or five people into every hotel room. If we got, if, even if we got to fly, we drove, we drove all kinds of miles. We didn't get much. So I, I came from that, and now, you know, just, just you know, Kevin always told me we're flying over to Japan pride first class and kevin would look at me and he'd say he, he would smile like he always smiles he'd say hey coleman we're going to be millionaires you know and and he, we, we were just so happy and, and we just felt so good and i you know i i don't know what we deserve i i, I just know i i've been given a lot personally and I, i'm just so happy right now that because kevin didn't really care too much about awards man when a couple of times he would he move from his apartment we go we a couple of friends would go back to his apartment and we check and see what he left behind. And there were times where he left his national championship trophy laying there. He, he you know, he just didn't care. But the, this Hall of Fame, this is something that Kevin really, really wanted. He this really meant a lot to him. And for him to get this, 
I'm just happy that they put me in the Hall of Fame. And now they put Kevin in the Hall of Fame. So I really can't complain too much, but I understand other people complaining and wanting more, but I, I'm just grateful. Okay. I mean, I really am just a grateful person. This might sound like a silly question from someone like myself, but could I ask uh, for a newer fan? Because there are a lot these days. You know, the ESPN era has brought a lot of new fans, and that's great for the sport. Who was Kevin Randleman? Can you tell them? And I know it's impossible to answer that question in a minute or two, but to you, yeah. who was Kevin Randleman? Kevin Randleman was um, he was the most charismatic, um, energetic, outgoing, kind, generous, giving person, loyal. He was so loyal to me. He was so loyal to so many people. He would he would he would help anybody out, no matter how busy he was. Um, th there's there's stories about him uh, saving a few guys from wanting to commit suicide. The guy just, uh, he, he was so great, but he stayed humble. Kevin always stayed humble. He was, he was greatness, but he was able to stay humble. And, uh, he was, he was always, he just always boosted. He boosted my confidence. When we were together, when me and Kevin were together hanging out, we didn't think anybody could beat us in, in anything. When we, we just, uh, he made me feel great. And hopefully I made him feel great. Uh, we, we were, we were a great team. And um, just nobody liked him. As far as athletics go, I mean, he could do anything. He couldn't beat me in tennis, though, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he could do anything in athletics. And, and we, we competed in everything we did. But uh, I certainly didn't ask him for a 100-yard sprint uh, race. Right, you know, right. I didn't want to go there. I picked and choose what we did when we competed. But, uh, he, he, you know, he just he lifted people up. And I, I, I don't judge somebody. I don't judge somebody how how a wealth of a man by how much money he has in the bank. I judge him by how he affected other people. And I, I, I honestly don't know anybody. I don't know any man or any person in the world that has affected other people in a positive way than Kevin the Monster Randleman. Wow! I just love the guy. We were we were brothers. We were definitely brothers. Tag team partners as well in Japan, which is uh, a pretty yeah. awesome part of your history. Favorite Kevin <laughs> Randleman fight? Pardon me? Favorite Kevin Randleman fight? Is there one that comes to mind? Oh, well, definitely Crow Cop. You know, yeah. how can you top that? I mean, he. Uh, uh, a lot of people don't know that uh, the Hammer House guys, they, they think we were just barbaric, crazy fighters. But we, we both, me and Kevin both had tons and tons of strategy when we were out there. And, uh, you know, Kevin had planned on using that that left hook before the fight. That was that was his go-to. That's how he planned on winning that fight. And and um, you can't forget that. You can't forget the – I mean, he, everybody remembers that. Everybody remembers him damn near killing Fedor, maybe a quarter inch off. Yeah. Who else Who else suplexes a guy like that? Kevin the Monster Randall. And I used to – you know, I showed him how to – I, I like to knee people on the head from north south, and uh, we. I was talking to Kevin, saying, you know, you got you got to start working this in. Well, Kevin wasn't just going to use one knee to knee somebody in the head. That's all. Bit jumped up in the air, and he threw. He would two, throw two flying knees at the guy. He always had to. He always had to one up. And when it came to pro wrestling, uh, one day, so his first pro wrestling, they wanted to see. You know, we didn't have no practice, we didn't have no training, but we we got the night before. And he's jumping off the top rope, doing a flying elbow on onto the ground. So they they asked him if he could jump to the middle of the ring. He did that with ease, and he got high. Then they scooted back. They kept scooting back. Next thing you know, he was jumping from one corner, pretty much all the way to the other corner. He probably did it about twenty times. I was just scratching my head because it couldn't be too comfortable. You know, it couldn't be too comfortable landing on your damn hip like that. But uh. You know, he just loved to show off, man. He wanted to he, he wanted to be every pro wrestler combined. You know, he wanted to take a little bit from Ric Flair, Hogan, uh Stone Cold. He wanted a little bit of everybody. He could do a little bit of everything. Uh Rick Steiner, uh he, he could do the Frankensteiner, which was beautiful. And um but we get back to the hotel room and he's looking at me, he's laying down, he's like, oh, I don't feel good, Coleman. I don't feel too good. What's wrong? He's like, uh, my leg's killing me, man. I don't know why, man. I don't know why. I'm like, well, Kevin, you know, maybe you landed on your leg like 20 fucking times from a, from a mile away. 
I just don't believe it. He didn't know why his leg was hurting. And and we as warned by the other wrestlers, they're like, don't show them everything you can do because they'll make you do it. Mm -hmm. But Kevin was going to show everybody everything. And uh, I stayed on the ground. I was more of the safe one. He was the high flyer. What a legend. I'll never forget Mauro Ronaldo's call of that uh, that amazing moment with yeah. uh, Mirko Krokop just screaming at the top of his lungs, one of the greatest moments in the history of Pride. Um, can I ask you before I let you go, Mark, if, uh, if there's any fighter in his prime right now who's feeling like he's on top of the world, who's making some good money, if there's anything that you could say to that person, because as you know, the money doesn't last forever, right? The spotlight doesn't last yeah. forever. Uh, you guys were sitting in first class talking about, you know, you're going to be millionaires. What, what, what would you say to that person? What kind of advice would you give to the fighter in his prime about what is to come after fighting? Well, just remember where you came from. I mean, it's really, it's really easy to, to get so high, get too high, get, get overconfident and get unhumble. You got to stay humble and, uh, you got to save, you know, it's hard to save. It's easy to spend. You got to save. You got to be smart with your money, but uh, just treat people, treat people with respect, be kind. Uh, I think uh, the old school fighters, most of us old school fighters were, were very super kind, super nice to everybody. And, and I think that's the way you got to be. Stay humble, save your money. And uh, you don't, don't think you're better than anybody because we're all the same here. I feel strongly about this. There, there is no UFC. There's no MMA without people like you. Without people like Kevin Randleman, um, I want to I want to send love to another member of the team, uh, Phil Baroni. I hope he's doing well as well. Um, yeah. You know, I wish him the best. I, I know it's not easy when uh, you know the spotlight goes away, and so I have so much love and admiration for you guys. And I speak for the entire M MMA community, if I can, to thank you and to thank Kevin for everything that you guys did for this sport that we love and to give people like me an opportunity to cover this sport for a living. So I'm so happy to hear that you're doing okay, that you're sober, that you're healthy, and that you will be there for Kevin on Thursday as he's inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame. Well, I, I will tell you, I, I mean, you asked me why I was so down. Um, I, I guess I didn't think about it, but, but to be honest with you, um, I was super down when the doctor called me up and told me, I had to get a hip replacement. My career was over. I was 44 years old, but I still thought I had plenty of fights left in me. And it was just, the, it was pulled from me just like that. And I wasn't ready for it. I mean, I went into a funk for 10 years. It's been over 10 years since I last fought, but now that I think about it, that was, uh, uh, and there's no reason, man. I, I, I got to do plenty. I, I was so blessed. I got to do so much. I got to wrestle so much. I got to fight so often. I need to be. I needed to be grateful, but instead I was bitter, and uh, I, I did. I could not handle life after fighting. I mean, I just did not handle it well, and um, I'm just lucky to be here today. So, these fighters out there, you know, give it all right now because it will go fast and it will come to an end someday. And prepare for when that day comes. I don't know how you're going to do for it. That's all I did was compete. And it was gone, and I wasn't ready. So you guys, find a way to prepare yourself for when it is going to end, because it's not a happy day. It's not a happy day, Ariel. God bless you, Mark. But thank you for thank for the kind words about Kevin. I'm, I'm ecstatic to be here, and 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 I know his wife is so happy. And uh, Kevin is he, he's up, he's in heaven, uh, watching down. He's looking over me. He's going to help me get through that speech. Mm. <laughs> I wish you the best, and what a great. Um, induction class it is with Mark Ratner, who I think the world of, George St. Pierre, and of course, John Jones yeah. and Alexander Gustafson going in for their great fight back in 2013. Uh, be well, my friend. All the best to you and your family, and uh, good luck tomorrow night. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me, Ariel. Appreciate it. All right. There he is, the godfather of ground and pound, Mark Coleman. Uh, I'm someone who back, you know, one of my first jobs uh, out of college was uh, a, a job for a show called uh, Classic Now. It was uh, a show for ESPN Classic, and my job uh, was a uh, researcher. And the reason I got that job in 2005, so I was 23, was because um, I always loved sports history. I always had great admiration and and respect for the guys who, you know, 
played long before I was born. I loved watching the old clips, whether it was baseball, basketball, football, fighting. Loved that. Loved the old broadcasters, Howard Cosell. I mean, my middle son's name is, is Walter in large part due to the fact that I loved Walter Cronkite. I wasn't even born when Walter Cronkite was, was you know, the, the, the anchor for the CBS Evening News. And um, I just, I just love the history of this sport. And I, and I just deeply, I'm not trying to stir the pot. I'm not trying to make trouble. I know some people will say that. I just want to see guys like Rampage and Mark Coleman and Carlos Condit and, and so many others get the love um, and the attention and the respect and the money that they deserve. And uh, I don't think that has been the case. And at the very least, if the money thing isn't, uh, you know, isn't a possibility, just get the attention, just get the, the, the love, the respect, just be remembered. And so I would, uh, I would sh strongly suggest that you, uh, if you are a new fan, you, you, you watch the old Coleman fights, you watch Randleman Krokop. You watch Pride, you watch the early UFC fights because those, I mean, there's there's no UFC today. There's no UFC 266. There's none of this without those guys. They made this sport and it was nowhere near as popular as it is today. It's just a, it's, it's a really special thing. So uh, thank you to Mark. He was very honest, very open, really great conversation. Uh, loved having him on and uh, I wish him the best tomorrow. And, and I suggest, you know, here I am talking. I have no problem with the UFC Hall of Fame for the record. Every sports team has their own retired jerseys, ring of fame, what it, wall of fame. They all have it, and it's great. I love that they do this. Mark Ratner getting love? Sign me up. George St. Pierre, you know how I feel about him. Jones Gustafson, great. Um, Kevin Randleman, great. I would just love to see an independent MMA Hall of Fame, but if we can't get that until we get that, support the UFC Hall of Fame. Uh, watch it tomorrow on Fight Pass. Uh, support these men. It's it's a great thing that they're doing because for a long time they didn't do it. And now it's a part of International Fight Week and I like that very much. All right, let's say uh, hello to our next guest. I'm very excited to talk to our next guest. He is a legend from the world of boxing, former CEO of Golden Boy Promotions, helped make Golden Boy Promotions into what it is today. And earlier this week, we found out that he is the new president of the new boxing promotion and media company called Probellum. He is also tied to the world of MMA these days as well. He is a man, if you know anything about boxing, in the last 20 plus years, you definitely know who Richard Schaefer is, and it's an absolute honor to have him on the program for the very first time. Richard, how are you, my friend? Very well, how are you? It's an honor to be on your show, and a big fan of yours, and I really like what you stand for. Oh, thank you, Richard. I appreciate it. I've been trying to reach out to you uh, for a very long time, and all it took was a text from Eric Winter, the legend, to, to link us up, and there you were within seconds. Uh, texting with me so this is as someone who has been watching your fights that you have promoted and put on for so many years it's it's actually somewhat surreal to to be talking to you right now so thank you for that thank you as well all right so we have a lot to talk about a big week for you uh monday the big announcement that you are now the new president of a boxing promotion and media company called probellum what is probellum richard well, first of all, I want to congratulate you for your citizen test uh, ah. yesterday. This is your citizen test. <laughs> yes, thank uh, you. I know that feels, uh, I'm an immigrant myself. I came here from Switzerland 35 years ago. You probably can still hear it in my accent. Um, and uh, I came with pretty much not more than a suitcase uh, full of dreams. And America really is the greatest country to be able to work with Floyd and with John and uh, now uh, entering into this exciting venture with Probellum uh, is just really a dream come true. So I can relate uh, on on that and so congratulations. Thank you. Um, Probellum, Probellum uh, is really something I've been, I've been waiting for. Uh, it starts with the team, the strength of the team. You mentioned Eric Winter before. He really is a legend. Uh, you said that well in his own. Uh, he's, uh, for those who don't know him, he uh, was instrumental in starting the fight pass at UFC. He was the former rival, at, at CEO of at Rivals and at Yahoo and was at DirecTV. And then you have Harrison Whitman, uh, amazing strategic mind who uh, worked uh, as, a, as, a, as a big time lawyer at a big law firm here in Los Angeles and uh, then at Top Rank as well. And then with Anthony Petrosa, you probably know him as well. Uh, he's done a lot of production for UFC and uh, Emmy Award winning producer. So it's just a great team. And what we want to do with Probellum is different than what I've done at Golden Boy. It's frankly different than any other promoter. And it might 
sound strange and weird and uh, probably unbelievable, but we actually want to bring unity to the sport of boxing. We want to help to elevate the sport and unite all these fragmented different promoters and work with all of them, work with all the managers and really elevate the, in the process the sport of boxing. And so people have talked about unity and, 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 you know, you know, there's a lot of interesting characters in this sport. Uh, there's a lot of fragmentation. People don't want to co-promote. They don't want to work together. There's the TV networks. Obviously, I think everyone would like that. How do you get it done? How do you work with all these characters who, you know, have very big egos and who are alpha males? How, how do you plan to do this? I think the benefit I have, I know all of these characters uh -huh. and uh, we actually want to start, uh, from the bottom up. We want to really get involved on the grassroots level as well. We want to empower local promoters. And I'm not just talking about here in the United States, I'm talking globally. So we really want to focus on the amateur system as well. And we want to, we want to really let the sport grow from the bottom up. We have uh, tremendous access to capital and to sponsors. So we want to become co-promoters with some of these other promoters. We want to really elevate, help them elevate their brands and their platforms. And, you know, it's not going to be, as they say, Rome wasn't built overnight. But I think where there is a way, uh, where there is a will, there is a way. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We want those fights to happen. And I think that's the problem, which has been a problem for boxing for so long. At UFC, you see these fights happening. And at boxing, you have like these different leagues. And we want to we want to build bridges and we want to be in between. We want to help. Uh, with our access to sponsors, to venues, to all of that, and get these big fights done. Why did you call it Probellum? Well, um, it's just a great name. I love the I love the logo uh, our our people came up with, uh, and it sort of like ties in a bit with one of my favorite movies, John Wick, par, uh, uh, which had a similar name, uh, Parabellum. And uh, I think it's a powerful name. It's Latin. It stands, uh, it embraces the past. Uh, boxing is one of the oldest sports going back to the gladiator days, Latin and Rome and all that. And then it is modern. And I think we sort of like brought the modern twist to it. I think the logo is sort of like almost uh, Superman-like. Uh, it's a great logo. It's a strong brand. Uh, and it, it embraces the past and it will define the future. What, what, when do you expect to put on your first event? Uh, the company is going to be promoting worldwide. So the U.S. in the beginning is probably going to be less important. Uh, we are going to be focusing a, a lot on the, a lot of overseas fights. I think the first one is going to be in November uh, in the U.K. in a co-promotion uh, with some of the leading U.K. promoters as well. Uh, so we're going to do all of these different things. Uh, we're going to be focusing as well on so like underdeveloped markets uh, like Africa, for example, a perfect example with UFC. Uh, I believe that um, some of the best athletes today in basketball as well uh, are coming from the African continent. And in boxing, they sort of like have been perceived as opponents. They are being built up in Africa, come over here as, a, as opponent, usually put into fights too early on. They lose the fights and then they're being shipped back to Africa. We don't want to do that. We want to build champions in Africa uh, and we want to put on events in Africa. Uh, our goal is in the first year, and it's, I know it's ambitious, but I know we will achieve it, is to put, uh, to be involved in a hundred events. Wow. hundred events. hundred events. events in one year, uh, in the midst, at least as of now, hopefully not forever, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, that, that is challenge. I mean, it's challenging in its own right to do a hundred events in the midst of the pandemic as well. Wh why such a large number in one year? Well, because uh, as I said, it will not just be events which we stage on our sure. own, but it will be with the Probellum brand involved. And that can be, we are going to be announcing in the coming weeks, uh, several co-promotional agreements uh, in, in about five or six different markets and regions. So Probellum is going to be very active in markets around the world. So th some of those fights will come from there. But of course, we will focus on the two key markets as well, the two most mature markets in boxing, which is the UK and uh, and the United States. So here we will do co-promotions as well. As I said, we will work with different promoters. Some of those co-promotional agreements will be revealed in the coming days and coming weeks. Uh, and then we're going to do, as I mentioned, the grassroots boxing. 
Uh, we're going to do uh, events in Mexico as well, uh, um, in Puerto Rico, in Canada. So we really are going to be focus, focusing on building ProBellum into a global brand. Do you have any fighters that will be exclusively signed to ProBellum? Uh, yes, uh, we are going to be announcing in the coming days uh, probably 20 to 30 fighters uh, which are exclusively signed uh, to ProBellum. And then there are going to be some others which we will be announcing as well, which we will promote in co-promotion with other promoters. And I think that's a key right there. In the past, a promoter always wanted to keep the fighters to themselves and we don't share them and they can only fight on our platform and so on. And I think that's wrong for the sport. So we have no problem sharing a fighter with another promoter uh, if it allows a fighter to participate in fights on different platforms. And that's fundamentally different than anybody else has done in boxing. Think about it to allow one of your star fighters to be co become co-promoted with a rival promoter, unheard of. But it's for the betterment of the fighter, and it certainly is for the betterment of the sport. Will you be um, in business or tied to exclusively to any specific TV network? Uh, we will have our own network relationships, but the idea really is to uh, avoid exclusivity because exclusivity, I think, hurts the fighters and hurts the sport. So um, we really want to do what is right for the sport and what is right for the fighter. And that means you're going to have to have network flexibility. Okay. Do you have any deals right now with any networks? Uh, they will be announced as well in the coming uh, coming weeks. Uh, we just announced this week uh, the start. Uh, it was really about announcing the team. Uh, it was uh, it was about announcing our mission and our vision. Uh, but it really was about the team. Uh, I I feel that this is like an all star team. I've never seen a team in boxing with that kind of corporate background, with that kind of experience, and that fine kind of financial capital behind them as well so um you know i was as i said i was waiting for an opportunity like that to really sort of like bring a corporate structure into boxing and so this week was really about that but we will be over the next five six weeks almost on a daily basis coming out with press releasing with press releases announcing network deals announcing fighter signing announcing some of our founding sponsors um uh, uh, announcing all sort of different uh, uh, the kind of talent which we which we will use uh, for our shows. So there's going to be a lot of announcements coming on in the coming days and weeks. Um, when you uh, parted ways with Golden Boy, you had a venture called Ringstar. What's the difference between this venture and that one? Well, Ringstar was sort of like a placeholder. I you know after I left uh, Golden Boy, I sort of like. Uh, I was fortunate to build up Golden Boy at the time into what was the largest boxing promotion company, promoted close to 400 or over 400 events. Um, and so I sort of like saw first, um, I mean, they tried to keep me out for like um, with a non-compete for like four years or so, which didn't work. So I could have actually come back, but I didn't because I wasn't so sure whether I want to do that again. But um, then fighters started calling me and, you know, I saw a lot of, uh, found a lot of love from the boxing fans and uh, they so like asked me to come back and so i said okay and i love the sport i'm passionate about it so i formed ringstar ringstar was sort of like a one-man show uh like you know a small fish in a big pond and it's very difficult to compete in in anything if you sort of like a small fish in a big pond and i sort of like had it as a placeholder and uh during that time i was pursuing uh, other opportunities and I was waiting for an opportunity to really get involved at the absolute highest level and build a boxing promotion business from the ground up with the right team, the right people, the right vision, the right capital and really take, bring the corporate world, bring a corporate structure to boxing and it took the while, it took the long time to find that group. To, who have a similar passion and a similar vision, but with Probellum, we have that now, and uh, I'm all fired up to to get this going. I love it. I, I absolutely love it. Could I ask, you know, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask, do you have any kind of relationship with Oscar anymore? 
no. Uh, he sort of like went his way and I went my way. And uh, I'm very proud of what I've done there. And, you know, not just what I've done for him with Golden Boy, but what I've done for him outside uh, of the ring as well. I, uh, I structured for him a deal where he could invest in the use in Dynamo soccer franchise. And that was a very successful one and some real estate ventures as well and other things. So I'm very proud of what I've done for him inside and outside of the ring and building up Golden Boy. But sometimes, you know, you just need to move on and you need to, uh, and it's not easy, you know, to move on. I mean, you know that as well, you know, when you sort of like entrenched in something and it's successful and it's going very well and you could sort of like stay there for the rest of your life and, and, but sometimes you need change and sometimes you need new, you need that fire again, you know, and, for me, it was time to move on. But for Oscar, it was time to move on as well. And uh, and we parted ways. Okay. Um, well, this is the second time, I would say, this year that you've uh, created a lot of buzz. Because earlier, and this and the first one really came out of nowhere. Uh, earlier this year, uh, John Jones announced that he had retained you as his advisor, that he had parted ways with his longtime management team, first round management, Malki Kawa and his brother, Abraham Kawa. And he had retained you, Richard Schaefer, uh, the, the great boxing promoter, over 400 fights you promote, CEO of Golden Boy, all this stuff, as his new advisor, as he was trying to figure out his next step with the UFC, moving up to heavyweight and all this stuff. Could I ask, before I ask the obvious question, which I'm sure you knew was coming about what's going on right now with John, how did this happen? How did you and John Jones even link up? Well, it was actually through a mutual uh, relation, a mutual friend, um, and I never, I've always been, I can't say always, in the very beginning, I wasn't really a UFC fan, uh, but I really became a fan. I love what Dana does. I have a nice friendly relationship with Dana and with Hunter as well, and I just respect them for what they do. They built the sport, and love them or hate them, you've got to respect that. And uh, they built something out of virtually nothing, you know, and, and, and so I really always liked them, always so I was a fan, but I never saw that I was going to get involved uh, advising an MMA fighter. Um, but uh, John went uh, after he split it, uh, parted ways with his, with his old management firm. He was going to interview a group of different, different agencies and managers and stuff like that. And then I guess his friend told him, hey, you should meet Richard Schaefer. And uh, so we met in L.A. We immediately connected. Um, I'm, I'm known in boxing as a fighter first promoter uh, because without the talent, you have nothing. Without the talent, we are nothing. There is no sport. You know, uh, I don't have a job. You don't have a job. But certainly not in this industry. We're not, we'd be working somewhere else. I might be back in banking. But so it really starts with the with the talent and here he, he realized that but he realized as well that through my experience in boxing i was involved and structured some of the biggest pay-per-view events in the history of combat sports um and so he really wanted somebody with that expertise but he sort of like wanted somebody who is independent from ufc who doesn't has like the background and already sort of like in the UFC world, he wanted a fresh and different perspective. And it really reminded me in many ways, uh, going back to 2000, when Oscar De La Hoya did exactly the same. I mean, I was a boxing fan, but I never thought I was going to be leaving my banking days behind and go into boxing. But he wanted somebody with a different perspective. And John wanted exactly the same. So we connected that night uh, here in LA when we met and had a great meeting, spent several hours together. And he told his people um, that he wants to work with me and he wants me and uh, and uh, was very, very within a matter of, of a day or two, uh, we worked out our deal. And uh, then I called my good friend Dana and gave him the news. And how did he receive that news? <laughs> he actually, uh, he's, he's, I think his first words like, wow, wow. <laughs> and maybe, maybe another wow. So uh, it was like he was surprised and shocked. Um, and then he said, I remember that after a few wows, he said, good luck. <laughs> and, um, you know, you have to realize back then, uh, uh, John and Dana, they went, they, you know, they went at it a bit. There were some, I wouldn't say Twitter wars, but right. there were certainly some cheated arguments going back and forth. And, uh, 
And I, I, as I said, I like Dana. We get along well, and he, he, he respects me for what I've done and my business acumen. And so uh, he, he said some very nice things uh, on air as well on different platforms. And uh, I told John, I said, look, what we need to do is we need to really not, not that the, that the relationship was broken, but we need to sort of like reset the relationship. And don't not get involved anymore with, and I always tell that to my athletes, don't get involved in these public Twitter wars um, because it's not in the end. It's just going to people take in their heels. And if we want to get big fights done, the only way you get big fights done, you negotiate behind closed doors. And I know the media guys are calling and they want to know every step of those negotiations, but seal your lips and let's get a fight done. And I explained that to John and he totally agreed and you've seen that, that there's no more Twitter wars. Uh, the relationship with UFC and with Dana is now a relationship of mutual respect. Um, and uh, so I think we've done, we've made big inroads there. And then of course, uh, the next topic, the next thing was uh, he, he, he told me what he wants. I mean, what he wants from it professional point of view what his goals are and he was very clear from the very beginning he wants to fight for the heavyweight championship and so i sat down with dana and with hunter and um you know first they tried maybe to do another like a comeback fight or an interim fight or this or that and i said no he wants to do a fight um, he wants to fight uh, first we were thinking about maybe november or december but he really then felt that he wants to train, he's the ultimate professional. I mean, I honestly have only seen once an athlete which is so structured and so strategic in his training, and that's Floyd Mayweather. And I think that's why they both are the GOATs. One is the GOAT of boxing and the other one is the GOAT of MMA. They go about it in a very strategic manner. So he said, look, I'm not gonna be ready in November or December. I wanna, I wanna bulk up, I wanna, I wanna, but I want to bulk up in a smart way, in a strategic way, not just like gain weight and be a big heavyweight. I want to weigh, gain the right weight. And I, I want to, I, by the way, I talked to him yesterday. Uh, he is 260 pounds now. Wow. Uh, which is exactly wow. 60, and wow. 60, but not like, I mean, 260 muscles, strong, yeah, yeah. Uh, explosive. Uh, and his goal is to go to 275. Um, and basically be the biggest and baddest heavyweight UFC has ever seen. And, you know, the way he mentally and strategically prepares himself, as I said, I've just never seen it. And I am sure based on my what, 20 plus, 20 plus years experience in combat sports, I can assure you, as I'm sitting here, based on what I've seen from him, based on his mental and physical preparedness and how he goes about it. We will have next year a new heavyweight champion and his right, his name will be John Jones. So my understanding is that Francis Ngannou and Cyril Gann are going to fight for the uh, unification bout in January or February. When does that mean we see John Jones fight? Like next summer? Yeah, so basically, I understand it's probably going to be in January. Yeah. Uh, and so you're probably going to have to, uh, you know, sometime sometime towards the middle of next year and you know i i see that in boxing as well sometimes when you are an athlete who has been very active and who has done a lot of fights it actually is a benefit when you take some time off and you let your body rest you let your soul rest uh, you 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 let your mind refocus and you come back with that fire again and so he actually i think that layoff is going to play in his favor, favor, and he sort of like has no problem to watch on how uh, these other guys are going to beat themselves up, and then he's going to come in and he's going to, you know, claim the day. Uh, what about the money issue? Because they seem to be very far apart on on, on that one. Yes. Yeah, so I, um, you know, I think what we need to do is, as I said, I think that's one of the benefits because I know the pay per view. Uh, structure the revenue sources from all the different revenue sources. I know what they are. I know where they come from. So I can have an intelligent conversation with Hunter and with Dana about this and find a way 
um, you know, you're never going to be able to get the, the ideal structure, but the key is to find a structure which UFC can live with and John can live with. Mm. And probably neither party is going to be totally happy about it, but I think that's the deal which is going to get made. Um, and that's how the fight is going to get made. And I have to say, I've, I've had, I've had very good, uh, conversations, uh, about such a structure and how to go about it. And, um, I, I believe that we are going to get, I'm not do I believe, I know we're going to get that fight done. Wow. Because this could be, this could really be the biggest fight. This could be the, in my opinion, the biggest fight in combat sports history. Um, because, uh, these are just two unbelievable athletes. Uh, I, I mean, especially if it's in Ganyu against, um, against John or John against the Ganyu, that, that is just like a dream match. Yeah. Yeah. No, it'd be just, amazing. I, I, if I put my promo, I mean, not the promoter UFC is, but I'm certainly going to help in any way, shape or form, uh, to make this fight as big as we can. Uh, and I'm so fired up. I mean, it gives me the chills just to think of it. I know. I've been, I've been talking about this fight for what feels like forever. So, so I'm assuming, so based on your comments, you will still work with John despite the fact that Probellum is now a thing, which I think is very good news for everyone who wants to see this, uh, this fight come to fruition. Unfortunately, we only have like a minute left. Uh, Richard, this has been such a great conversation. I hope we can do it again in the future. I did want to ask, I understand there's a great story behind that uh, statue over there, over your right shoulder. Could you tell us about that, the Bernard yeah, Hopkins that statue? That is uh, Bernard Hopkins. Uh, that's uh, back in 2007, I think it was, he fought Kelly Pavlik in Atlantic City. Kelly Pavlik was the uh, undisputed uh, middleweight champion, and uh, he uh, was the younger, stronger uh, fighter. And at that time, Bernard Hopkins was in his mid-40s. Uh, there was virtually nobody um, who gave him a chance. Uh, uh, people, the media were worried about it and they said like, oh, you shouldn't let him fight. This is crazy. He's going to get, he can get injured and it's going to be really bad. And I said, well, you know, I believe in Bernard Hopkins. He's another goat. Uh, and, uh, we did that fight in Atlantic City and he, uh, it was a 12 round fight. He beat up, schooled the young fight, the young fighter, Kelly Pavlik. Kelly Pavlik didn't win a round. It was all Hopkins. And after the fight, the post-fight press conference, Bernard comes in, all the media guys are there, they're in awe. And he looks at them and he says, nobody here, nobody here believed in me. In this entire room, there's one person who believed in me, and that was Richard Schaefer, who bought me this fight. Thank you, Richard. And he gave me the entire outfit, wow. the shoes, shorts, with the mask and everything. Wow. And so this is a reminder for me. I have that here uh, in my office. Uh, this is a reminder for me that that if you put your mind to it, you can and you will. And Bernard Hopkins, in that regard, is is an inspiration. Was an inspiration to me. So was the one right behind me here, Floyd Mayweather. Um, what he how, 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 how he worked and how his ethics and how, how he went about it. No drinking, no smoking, no nothing. Just an absolute total professional. And you see the results year after year, the highest paid athlete in the world. So for me, so for me to work with fighters like that to help them is really has been an honor and to help them become the GOAT, uh, and to be working with John Jones, who is the GOAT, and now with Probellum, who I will try to build into the GOAT. <laughs> you don't become, you don't become a GOAT overnight. It takes time. It took time for these guys here. And you've got to give me some time with Probellum, but I have no no doubt that Probellum will become the goat of boxing promotions. I love it. I wish you the best, my friend. Uh, what what a great conversation. I really appreciate you coming on. Best of luck to you and the team with Probellum. Best of luck with John. Thank you for all the insight. Please do come back. Keep in touch. And I can't wait for the first uh, few shows that you're going to put on. I'm, I'm really excited about this. Thank you so much, Richard. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Until soon. All right. There he is. Richard Schaefer. How much fun was that? That was great. Great insight. 275 pounds, John Jones, who fought at 205. Wow. 
That is amazing stuff. Could you imagine John Jones fighting at 260 something pounds? A big Jack John Jones. I saw him working out yesterday. I mean, his quads look massive. Great insight there. Like I said, I said it recently. The sport of boxing is on fire right now. Make no mistake about it. People want to talk about Jake Paul this. Jake, the sport of boxing is on fire right now. And uh, another indication, a guy like Richard Schaefer coming back and launching this with some very smart people. I know Eric Winter very uh, very well, a great guy who was a big part of um, UFC Fight Pass, also um, launched Rivals for, for Yahoo and has been around the media business for quite some time. Um, it's just a, uh, a really great team of people, and I really look forward to seeing what they do, and I look forward to seeing what he does with John Jones as well. All right, let's rewind the tape here. Beginning of the show, we had Lauren Murphy on. We couldn't hear. Now we have uh, fixed all our problems. I feel horrible about it because I have horrible, guilty conscience. I'm a very, very guilty person, and so let's go back to the Zoom machine. She's fighting at the co-main event on Saturday, and she came back. She could have told us all to take a hike, but she came back. There she is, Lauren Murphy. How are you? We can hear you now. Awesome. Yeah, I'm good, man. Thanks for having me on. Oh, this is uh, this is a great pleasure. I really appreciate it. And again, I'm sorry about that. I know you've got a million things on your mind and a million things to do. And the last thing you want to do is come back and do another interview again. So I apologize on behalf of the whole team for this. Uh, thank you for doing it. I know you have a, a tight window here, right? Just so I know you have like, what, 10 minutes or so for us? Uh, actually, we, it works out. We kind of have a longer window now. Oh. So uh, I'm done with most of my media for the day. And check me out. You caught me in my Venom gear, too. Oh so I gosh. just got done with my photo shoot and everything. And uh, so now you guys know I have the white fight kit okay. for Saturday night. <laughs> um, well, that's good. So I don't have to feel like I'm, uh, you know, the micro machine guy. Um, actually, I wanted to start with that because you talked about, um, you know, the photo shoot. You, you, you had a really nice post about Susie, the, the longtime makeup artist who unfortunately recently passed away after her battle with cancer. I knew Susie very well as well, and she always made me feel so great and comfortable, but I know that her relationship with the fighters was a lot different, and what you wrote, I think, really um, explained and encompassed what made her so special. Do you mind verbalizing that for us? Why, why did you feel such a strong connection to the late, great Susie Q, as people like to call her? Yeah, she was amazing. Actually, Mike Roach just did the photo shoot, and he was like, man, first one without Susie. I said, yeah, no, it's, it is pretty sad. Um, but man, she would be so proud. Like, she would be so happy for me to see me, you know, at the co main event fighting for the title. Like, she just loved it because she was, you know, there from the beginning. And uh, the first UFC fight I had, we were in Bangor, Maine, I think, for my debut. It was just a small town. I was really like awkward in front of the camera. I, I felt really shy and like unconfident. And, uh, just unsure of myself and man she was like the first person i remember in the ufc that just made me feel so comfortable she really made me feel like i belonged and she would just chit chat and joke around and like she made me feel very pretty she made me feel like like i just had a place there you know and she was easy to talk to and um it was just such a good experience working with her and i've worked with uh, other makeup artists outside the ufc and i'm man Susie set the bar high so <laughs> she she was really something special and she's she has missed a lot so she has um or she had i should say an infectious smile an infectious laugh just a really great ability to make you guys comfortable because i've I, i've seen it firsthand some fighters who are a little bit shy who are there to just fight and they they're not there for the photos and everything and she just made you guys feel very comfortable so i i thought your words were really nice on your instagram and um that was that was a great way to start this conversation obviously you're in you're in vegas for the biggest fight of your life you've been in this game for a decade now um but you've never fought for a ufc belt against one of the greatest ever on on wednesday at midday twelve thirty or so before the biggest fight of your life could you describe what is going on in your body are you feeling calm nervous anxious how would you describe it three days before the fight Oh, I have bouts of, um, you know, nerves and a little bit of anxiety here and there. And then I have, you know, moments where I feel very calm and confident and like it, you know, I think that roller coaster, I think everybody kind of goes through it a little bit, you know, um, but, uh, you know, I've been in this game long enough and uh, I'm surrounded by a great team and I've learned how to deal with those nerves. And what I know now is that they're not even a bad thing. It's not bad to feel a little bit nervous or like you know, get that, get butterflies in your stomach. It's like, I'm about to get in a fist fight in my underwear in front of the whole world. Like you probably should be a little bit nervous about that. If you're not, you know, there's probably a couple screws loose. So, 
you know, it's, but it, it's also, um, I feel like overwhelming gratitude. I feel so like happy. I'm very, very proud of myself. Um, I don't know. I just, I'm loving this. This is like something that many, many fighters dream about and they never, you know, get to realize. And for me to see, like, we really, like, we bled and sweat and cried and grinded our way to the top. And uh, for me, I just don't think there's any other way it could ever have been. <laughs> like, that's, you know, how my life has kind of been. That's how my fight career has been. And uh, I think that's how the fight's going to go Saturday night. It's going to be a grind. It's going to be hard. It's going to hurt. There's going to be um, a lot of challenges to overcome. But I believe in my ability to overcome those challenges. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. You got into this whole crazy sport because your son was taking jujitsu classes, right? And you were just trying to like get him to engage and, and, and compete as well. And so you started doing it and then you fell in love with jujitsu and that's what led to all of this. Is that accurate? That's it. I had never played a sport in my life. Um, well, okay. I, I take that back. I played softball once when I was seven, okay. but like, other than that, I had never really, yeah, played like a organized sport. I didn't know anything about it. I, I actually smoked cigarettes. I smoked like a pack of Marlboro reds every day. I, uh, had a really, un, you know, just an unhealthy lifestyle. And, um, my son was eight and I was like, man, it would be cool. If, you know, he got to do martial arts, like all the confidence and, uh, make some friends and discipline all the, all the benefits that come with, you know, martial arts, especially as a kid. And so I literally, this is back when we had phone books, I opened up the phone book and I stuck my finger in it and it landed on a Gracie Baja, which I had no idea what that even was. So I called the place. I talked to the woman that answered and, um, she was like, you know, this is ground fighting. It's like joint locks and submissions. And I was like, ah, I don't know about all that. I kind of want to, you know, yeah. punch some shit or <laughs> kick something, you know. And she said, well, you know, that's fair. But, you know, 90% of fights end up on the ground. And like the minute she said that, I was like, oh, my God, that's true. You know, that's true. So uh, I was like, OK, we'll be right. You know, we'll come in for your class tonight. And so we went in and uh, just to kind of encourage my son, I took the adult class. And I just fell in love with it. I had never experienced anything like that. You know, I, I was naturally really strong. I was naturally very competitive. Um, I wanted to like be good. And I thought to myself like, man, it's probably too late for me to really like do anything. But you know, maybe if I do it for a year or something, at least a year from now, I won't be wishing that I had started a year ago. So maybe today's the day. And I started going a couple times a week and then that turned into to like five days a week and then it was every day and then it was twice a day and then I was like working my schedule around it and you know my son he never did fall in love with it like really? I did he actually kind of hated it <laughs> yeah That's he so was like oh they're all touching each other I don't like it <laughs> I was that was actually my next question if he kind of pursued it as well obviously not um could I ask what were you doing at that like what year is this so you started in 2010 your fighting career started in 2010 but what year was this this was late 2009. So I started jujitsu in um, like November of 2009. Uh, I started training uh, with the MMA team at this very small school in Alaska, like the next uh, spring, so like February or March. And I took my first pro fight in June of 2010. Okay. Now, what were you doing? Like, what was your job at that point in your life? I was going to be a nurse. I was in nursing school and I was actually pretty far along in nursing school. Um, and I, I was a good student. I thought that that was my path. I thought that I wanted to be a nurse and I, I got through, um, I did, you know, I, I test really well. I liked school. And so I had gotten through all this stuff in school and, um, got into the clinical portion of my studies where we were actually at the hospital treating patients with a professor, you know, kind of overseeing us. And I realized I really didn't love it. I really, did not want to be a nurse. And um, I, it was a kind of a shock to me. It was certainly a shock to my family. Um, and like I said, I wasn't really living the best lifestyle back then. Like I, I was drinking a lot and um, I had a lot of, had a lot of personal issues going on and um, it all just kind of came together where I ended up not finishing nursing school and um, started fighting. And, and right around the time that I figured out I didn't want to be a nurse, I had won my first professional title and I just, I loved fighting so much and I never thought like this would be a job. I never thought that this would be like, I certainly never thought I, I would be here, but um, I knew I didn't want to be a nurse and I knew I loved fighting. <laughs> wow. What an unbelievable story. Like Im imagine 10 years ago, someone telling you you'd be fighting on a UFC pay-per-view above Nick Diaz, who at the time was already a superstar, right? Like, I mean, the whole thing is kind of insane, right? 
it's I think about that all the time. Like if some if somebody from the future had come and told that room of athletes, like one of you is going to fight for the UFC title. One of you, you know, it, no, like I would have been the last person anybody would have guessed. You know? <laughs> so including myself, but it was actually a really cool um, MMA team that I started with in Alaska. Uh, Jared Cannonier was in that room with us. He, you know, we trained together since I was a white belt. Um, uh, there was a guy, Andy Enns. He ended up in the UFC. We had a couple actually really talented guys that were on that, you know, kind of um, first MMA team that I trained on in that small little, you know, small little school in Alaska. What do you think you'd be doing now if you never took your, your son to jiu-jitsu class? Oh, I don't know, but it, it wouldn't be good. It w well, it wouldn't be as good for sure. Um, like if I could have planned out what my life would have looked like all those years ago, man, I would have sold myself short a thousand times over, you know, even if I had like picked the best thing I thought for myself, like it would not have been as good as what I, as what we got going on today. Um, I don't know. I'd probably still be in Alaska, which Alaska is a great place. I'm proud to be from that state, but I also felt very isolated up there. Um, but, you know, I, I'd grown up there. I, I knew almost everybody up there and just had a lot of um, like bad, <laughs> bad, I don't know, hanging out with bad people, kind of doing bad things up there. And I think it was really good for me to get out of Alaska and kind of get away from that scene and, and be able to start fresh with, you know, my husband, Joe, he was my boyfriend at the time, but you know, we've been married since. And, um, yeah, I don't really like to think about it, honestly, because I think my life would not be as good. I think my son's life would not be as good. You know, I think his mom would not have been able to be the example to him that she is today. So, yeah, definitely nowhere near what we're doing now. <laughs> and of course, now you no longer live in Alaska. You you live and train out of Houston, Texas. Um, when did you move? How long ago did you move to Houston? So we moved out of Alaska um, in 2012. And we moved to Florida first. My husband is military and he was stationed in Florida. So that's where we moved first. And I had a coach that I really liked who had moved to Houston from Alaska. And so we kind of went from Alaska, we went our separate ways. And I started driving to Texas from Florida. I would wow. just drive back and forth and I went to go get my blue belt from him. I was a white belt. So I went to go get my blue belt from him. And um, when I went to visit him, I was offered a fight in Legacy. And so um, that's honestly how everything started taking off, uh, you know, um, and then I got a, a contract with Invicta. So every time I had a fight, I would drive to Texas to train. Um, in 2013, I fought four times and it was all out of a camp in Houston, Texas. And so I really loved it. I was very successful. And my husband, um, just through a series of events and with his career, we ended up in Arizona and I trained at the MMA lab for five years, which was a really great experience. Um, that's where my UFC career started. And even though like I went two and four in my first like six fights in the UFC, like I, you know, I learned a lot at the lab. I think that they have made me a much better athlete. Yeah, I got to train with some really high level fighters like Benson Henderson and um, uh, Sean O'Malley and Kyler Phillips. Like it, it's really an ex Mackenzie Dern. Like it was awesome being able to train there. Um, but in 2019, I was like, man, I, I think it's time to make a change. And so we moved back to Houston. I got back with my old coach and um, we've been on a winning streak ever since. Yeah, five in a row. You you look great. I, I, I like the fighting, but I also like the fire. Like I remember last year in Abu Dhabi, like you, you're – you feel a lot more confident on the microphone about, you know, pushing yourself about saying what you want. Where is this all coming from? Practice, <laughs> you know, and messing it up a lot and uh, learning from my mistakes because like, I really, like we talked about with Susie, like when I first showed up to the UFC, like um, I grew up on a dirt road in Alaska, man. Like I wasn't the center of attention. I wasn't social media savvy. I was older when, when I got into MMA. So I was like, I'm from the Facebook days. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and uh, I, I, it's just been a lot of practice and a, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of learning experiences, but I am getting better on the mic and I'm getting better doing interviews. You know, you can, I'm getting better at putting myself out there too. And just, I think like on the ultimate fighter, I was so afraid to just be myself that I came across as really awkward and unconfident. And that's probably how I felt a little awkward and unconfident. So I've really kind of started to embrace like, this is who I am. This is how I am. This is what I do. And I'm proud of it. I, I've really started to love myself. It's one of the benefits of being a martial artist, I think, you know.
That's amazing. Uh, speaking of the Ultimate Fighter, uh, are you and Eddie Alvarez cool, or is that always going to be uh, a relationship that will that will never thrive? You'll never see eye to eye. Where does that stand right now? We don't talk. I don't okay. know. I don't. I don't ever really think about it. Yeah, I never think about him. Uh, you know, maybe if he were like still in the UFC and our paths were to cross, sometimes maybe it would be different. But it's like we literally we live on opposite ends of the country. Sure. We're not in the same promotion, so yeah, it, I don't think either of us think about each other. Do you have animosity towards him? Do you feel a certain way about him, or it's just non-existent? No, it's just non-existent. Like, I, yeah, I don't really care. Okay. Um, and so now you you get this uh, this this winning streak, and then you get the opportunity. Like this is the reward for winning five in a row, for looking tremendous out there, for getting on the mic, is to fight Valentina Shevchenko, arguably one of the greatest female fighters of all time. By the time it's all said and done, she might go down as the greatest. Some people thought she beat Amanda Nunes in their last fight, and uh, every I'm sure you've had to hear it from every loser on the internet about how you know she's going to smoke you and the 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 betting odds are against you and all this stuff how does one process that i can't imagine dealing with something like that like you're about to walk into something i get nervous like when i got an opportunity to be on the sidelines for nba i was so nervous i mean i could feel my heart coming out of my throat i can't imagine what it would be like to do that while having people tell me i'm going to fail or that i suck or that, you know what i mean how do you how do yeah. you balance that well, my focus really is just on, like, I really try to focus hard on just being, like, the best I can be. So I've practiced really hard. I have, to, I have a really great sparring partner that emulates Valentina really well. His name is Paris Moran. He's a great kid. Um, he's been part of our camp. You know, uh, he's a part of our camp and always has been. And so just to have him in our camp and be able to use him for this fight has really um, given me a lot of confidence. Like he can throw all the same spinning attacks that she throws. He's a natural southpaw. He fights at 125. So I'm blessed to have him in our camp. And also, I just try to focus really on like, OK, we're in the moment. Uh, I want to stay in the moment and I'm just going to go out and fight to the best of my ability and try to carry out the sequences and game plan that my coaches have set for me in all these different areas that the fight could go. And when I'm thinking about that, I'm not really thinking about like Valentina's reputation or her past accomplishments or what people think of her, because all that stuff is way out of my control anyway. And that's not even what I'm fighting. Like I'm fighting her body, you know, and she is human and she is amazing. She is great, but um, you know, she's just another tough chick in front of me, just like I've been doing for the last 10 or 12 years now. And, um, if I've just focused on myself and what I can do, then that, that's really like what has changed. I think this win streak is like come from that kind of focus and confidence. So how does one beat Valentina Shevchenko? Well, I know how I win fights and I, I <laughs> I, like, I'm just, I'm the toughest, grittiest, most durable female out there, I think. And um, I'm not a, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to take a beating. I'm not afraid to get in there and drag people into deep waters and make them tired. And uh, it's just, I think it's just so fitting because it's like, that's, that's how I fight. That's what I do. And uh, that's what I'm going to do Saturday night. Um, when you watch her tape, do you see holes? Like, do you see things that you are going to look to capitalize on? To the naked eye, it seems like she's... Oh, what? unbeatable that she's invincible but when you watch her as a pro do you see holes oh yeah i mean it, like okay so first of all like the level the champion that she is she didn't get there by having big glaring weaknesses you know what i mean like nobody at this level has like some it's like oh her ground game sucks or whatever she doesn't do this like nobody gets this far by having a game that's not extremely well-rounded and being good at all of it but also, you know, she, like I said, she is human. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has habits that, you know, your opponent can capitalize on. And everybody, nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect. And um, it only takes one mistake at this level, you know, one little mistake. And then I can capitalize on that, you know. And I think I have a way of frustrating people. I think I have a way of, like, discouraging people to where they lose their focus and they start making more and more mistakes. You, you did say, correct me if I'm wrong, she's never fought anyone as tough as you accurate yeah i think i think i'm one of the toughest most durable women certainly on the ufc roster and in my belief the entire world wow i love it that's confidence right there that's what you have to believe <laughs> going into a fight i love have you allowed yourself lauren to think what life would be like if you beat her on saturday life will change 
for you forever. It will be one of the biggest upsets in the history of this sport. And uh, and then you get the rematch, and there's all this stuff. Do you allow yourself to, like, when you go to bed at night, sometimes in training camp, do you think about what that feeling, the, the pandemonium, Dana putting the belt around your waist, everything, like all the hoopla? Do you even allow yourself to go there? Oh, sure. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, I think about it quite often, like quite often what it would be like to win and how I want to win. And I visualize Dana putting the belt around my waist and what it would be like to walk out of the cage with the belt. And, um, you know, to be honest with you, yeah, it would change a lot, I guess, but it wouldn't change the stuff that's really important. Like my coaches are going to love me. My husband and I have a great marriage. My son thinks I'm awesome. Um, I love I love what we're doing in Houston. Like, it, it would change some things, but it wouldn't change everything. Like all the important stuff is really intact in my life. And that's how we've set it up. Like, I, you know, so winning the belt would be cool. It would be a huge um, accomplishment. It would be a momentous occasion, but it's just one more moment in a whole like career fight of cool moments. Yeah. You know? What a journey. I'm wondering uh, your, your good friend and training partner, Derek Lewis, he's been in a couple of these spots before against some tough people. Did he give you any advice before your first UFC title fight? <laughs> he told me to not give a fuck. Okay. <laughs> That's great advice. That's tremendous advice. Um, I wish you the best. Do you want, do you want to, do you want to throw out a prediction? I, I obviously you're going to win in your mind, but how are you going to win? Uh, all I know is that um, I'm ready to go in there and fight to the very end. I know it's going to be a painful, hard experience, and I'm ready for that. I think, honestly, that's what I'm good at is I'm good at facing that kind of adversity and coming out on top. That's what I've been doing this whole time, and that's what I'm going to do on Saturday night. You know, The truth is, Ariel, that when people fight me, like when they're losing the fight, it's a hard, painful experience for them, and they don't love it. But even when they're winning the fight, it's going to be a hard, painful experience for them, and they're not going to love it. You know what I mean? I so I think I really think that that's like what I'm bringing to the table. I'm just so tough and durable. I'm willing to drag her into deep waters, and um, that's that's who I am, and that's what I do, and that's what's going to happen Saturday night, and that's how I'm going to get my hand raised. I love it. I will remember that on Saturday uh, as I'm watching that fight. Um, I wish you the best, Lauren. Sincerely, congratulations on making it this far on your journey. I want to apologize not only for the screw up earlier, but for taking so long to have you uh, on my show. It's really great to to meet you and to talk to you. And uh, before the biggest fight of your career, what an honor it is. So enjoy the week as much as you can. Good luck on Saturday. Can't wait to see how it all unfolds. And again, thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you. Hey, congrats on passing your citizenship test. That's uh, awesome. Thank you very Welcome. much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Here, I have my flag right here. There it is. Yay. <laughs> thank you so much, Lauren. Good luck to you. All right. Have a great day. You too. There she is, Lauren Murphy. And yes, I did pass my test yesterday. What a great moment that was in my life. So for those that don't know, you apply for citizenship um, and it takes about a year. I moved to America in... August of 2001, I went to Syracuse University, and uh, I've talked about that experience before, how difficult it was at times, how many times I wanted to quit, how I felt out of place and all this stuff, and I stuck with it. Um, I tried to quit a few times. My parents didn't let me. From there, I graduated, and I moved to New York City to work at HBO Sports, and I got a visa, a one-year visa to work at HBO Towards the end of that one year, they told me they were going to keep me around and, and sponsor me, and I would stick around, and I was so happy. I remember ordering a big old large pizza for myself with pineapple and green olives. It was fantastic. My favorite toppings for, for, for a pizza. I ate the whole thing. Large pineapple and green olives. If you've never had it, the sweet and the salt, ooh, it's fantastic. And I had a little pizza party, and then a couple of days later, HR told me, no, we can't. We can't keep you around. You're entry level. We can't sponsor your uh, your visa. And so I was out of work for a few months, talked to a whole bunch of people. In fact, even talked to WWE, couldn't get a job. And then finally, a company called K2 Pictures sponsored me. And then from that visa, I went to another visa and then another visa. And often people in my shoes will marry an American and that expedites things. And then you become an American citizen. I married a Canadian, so that didn't expedite things. And then I got a green card. And uh, the green card was coming to an end. Ten years I had this green card, amazingly. And so it was time, finally, to apply for citizenship. And it was really around the election of last year where it felt monumental and I wanted to do something. 
I wanted to take part and I felt like I couldn't, so I decided to get the ball rolling. Of course, you hire an immigration lawyer to do that and they tell you to you know have all this documents and send in all this stuff and it's a whole process and it takes a year. And then uh, then they tell you that you have an interview. And so we did the interview yesterday and you, t you take a test. There are a hundred questions to, uh, to learn from. And uh, they only ask you 10. You got to get six of 10. You got to answer six of 10 and also write a sentence. Luckily, I went six for six, so they called it off. Hiawani, once again, 10-7. The questions weren't that hard. And so then they congratulate you, and then they say you're going to come back and take the oath, which I think is, um, you know, I pledge allegiance to the flag. No, I don't think that's it. Anyway, I'll repeat whatever they say to me. And, uh, and then I'm officially American. So as of right this moment, I'm not a dual citizen just yet, but th that last step is really, you know, a formality. And so then I can have both these flags and I'll always be Canadian. I'll always love the great white North, but I'm proud to be almost an American as well. I mean, it's kind of surreal as a kid who grew up loving America, loving its culture, loving its athletes, its entertainers, its music, its movies, all that stuff. It's kind of surreal to be holding this. Like I always dreamed of uh, being an American as well and living the American dream. And now here I am hosting an MMA show on YouTube for all of you guys as I'm about to become an American. And my kids are American. They're born. They have 100% Canadian blood, yet they're born in a hospital here. And so they became Americans. And that's actually the best gift I could probably give them. So now they won't have to go through those visa issues. And it's really hard. It's hard to get a job. Um, people, Americans don't know how hard it is for non-Americans to get good jobs here. Um, because the general thinking is, oh, we got, you know, Americans, let's give it to them. And I get that. But you know, if you uh, if you put in the time, you go to school, you you pay your dues, you should have those opportunities as well. So I'm very thankful. I'm very excited. And uh, yesterday was a great day. I wore my Hiawani sweatshirt, my Bret Hart Roots of Fight shorts. I was feeling good about myself, a little bit stressed about it, but we got it done, baby. We got it done. Oh, beautiful. For spacious, I don't, I don't know. I need to learn. I need to learn the uh, the words to that song. Uh, na, 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 on my Substack page, arielhawani.substack.com. And usually around this time, I will sing our intro. Da -da 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 -da. Remember that? I've been doing it for the last few weeks. Well, I want to give a shout out to Mike Heck of MMAfighting.com, who is doing such a great job on this site, covering the sport, who a lot of people may not know was the one who put together the Rick's Pick song back in the day. Uh, has a background in radio and uh, audio music production, just reached out to me and said, hey, I want to make a theme song for the On the Nose segment. Everyone's favorite segment, stealing all the headlines, the talk of the town, dropping bombs, promos left and right, 10 sevens left and right, PF Changs, Shrimp, all that stuff. And so I said, yeah, sure. I mean, I've I've been liking the bootleg version, but why not? If you can make a theme song for us, I'll take it. And so without further ado, I premiere for the very first time, world exclusive, my friends, the brand new theme song for the critically acclaimed, the very popular, the most anticipated segment of the week on the nose. Hit it. It's time for a good old fashioned Q&A, MMA fans. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment has arrived to hear from the man himself, Ariel Helwani. Live from the Vox Studios in beautiful New York City, it's on the nose. And now, to answer your questions, get out of your seats and on your feet because here he is, Ariel Helwani. Hey, how great is that? Mike Heck, the man, the legend. That was amazing. I mean, that was just fantastic. Warm my heart. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, without further ado, let's answer some questions here. Enough dilly-dallying. And, uh, yeah. Again, I don't read the questions in advance. I don't know what you're going to say. Hopefully, we get a little variety here. 
We don't have to talk about the same thing every damn week. And then a reminder, at the end of these questions, uh, we're going to get our picks from Connor. So I hope he's ready for some 266 picks. Anything important happened in the sport? I mean, I saw the little thing there about, uh, oh, my, about one. Um, mm. About Robbie Lawler, I see a, a tweet here from my good friend Jedi Goodman, Nick Diaz, taking questions from Media Day at 4. Uh, Valentina was going to be at 4.30, but she's up now. We'll see if and when Diaz shows up. So let's see. Let's see. I want to hear from him. I hope he's doing well. All right, here we go. Uh, from Drew. Hello, Ariel. I'm what you would call a High Road Helwani era fan. I had seen clips and heard your name a bunch, but I really didn't start following your work until the ESPN venture. I must say I loved the work on DC and Helwani and that banter is some of what got me hooked on your insight. But your appearances on the Pat McAfee show, a.k.a. the Patrick McAfee show, is what really got me on board. As a pro wrestling fan myself, I was always interested to hear your takes as the heel Wani persona. I'm loving this new heel Wani era. Or shall I say, welcome back. You feel so much more engaged, and I can really feel the passion now. Kudos to you. Anywho. All right. Well, thank you for that. Uh, where do you see Max Holloway after this weekend's card? They would surely give him Ortega, but do you think they would grant him a third fight with Volkanovsky? Do you think Volk would want to grant him a third fight? Cheers. Uh, yes, I do. And I think they're going to give it to him. It would be great to hear from Max. Um, but uh, yeah, I do think that they're going to give it to him. Thank you for the kind words. Dan, can you have DC on the show? I think, honestly, like to shoot straight, I think it's a little too soon for that. He's doing his thing with Ryan Clark. I'm doing my thing. And, you know, you, you know, sometimes distance makes the heart grow fonder. I speak to him a thousand times a day, just to let you all know. Yesterday, we had a great conversation about me becoming... Uh, a U.S. citizen, or almost U.S. citizen, and we were even talking about the Blue Jays and baseball. I had no idea he was this into baseball. He's telling me all this stuff about Vlad Guerrero Jr., and we're talking about Nick Diaz, and 185 was that night. And so I love D.C., and I know in my heart we'll work together again, but it feels a little too soon to have him or Chael on the show. And I don't know if they would want to come on. I haven't asked them. Um, I don't want to put them on the spot. But you know what? Sometimes you... You build up to it, a little separation. It's good for everyone. Uh, hey, Ariel, this is from Matt. I uh, just want to say, big fan, love when you come on McAfee Show and chop it up with the Stooges. My question for you is, will you be doing any work with WWE, perhaps live TV, or is that not even a thought? Uh, not in the works. I'll tell you this. H how about this little scoop? In October, uh, I was asked to try out for one of those TV jobs that they had coming up. I didn't want to do it. That's not me. I'm not a play-by-play -play guy. I'm not. I felt more comfortable as the heel color analyst than the play-by-play -play guy. Um, I did both. It was an incredible experience. I got to do it with Michael Cole and Adam Graves. No, not Adam Graves. He's a hockey player. Corey Graves, and it was great. And they couldn't have been nicer and gracious. But I think I sucked at it. I bombed. Now, do I think I'm the best at cutting promos? Absolutely. Do I think I could be a heel manager? Absolutely. Do I think I could even be, you know, a guy in the booth as a non play by play guy, uh, a guy to build up the storylines? Absolutely. But play by play, not my thing. There are much better people out there to do that. Never been my thing. Um, and so right now, no talks of any of that. Uh, but I'm a fan and I watch and I enjoy it. And it was a good experience, something I'll never forget. But I just knew that that wasn't me. You got to know who you are. And that's not me. Um, Ariel, Masvidal versus Edwards for the BMF title. What are your thoughts? Is this the matchup to make? Sure, but it has to happen November 6th. If it doesn't happen November 6th or around that time, move on. By the way, Leon Edwards fought in June. Most of the guys that fought in June haven't even fought again. It's not even time for him. It's like his number isn't even up yet. So this thing that like, oh, he's sitting like, look at all the other guys. Izzy hasn't fought yet. Marvin Vittori hasn't fought yet. Nate hasn't fought yet. I can't remember, like, Figueredo and Moreno, they haven't fought yet. So, like, why is everyone pushing Leon to fight? Honestly, he could wait. I, but what doesn't make sense is to wait and fight in January when the title fight is in November. That makes no sense to me. Either you're fighting November 6th or, or we're getting the title shot. That's it. And quite frankly, if he wants to wait, if he has the funds, just wait. You've done enough. Uh, Anthony, Ariel, what do you think about the weight change for the Lawler-Diaz fight? Who do you think it benefits more to move to, to metal weight? Hmm. 
It's kind of hard. Big fan of the show. Keep them coming. Best MMA show out there. By the way, I just want to say one quick thing. And I was getting into something, uh, getting into it with someone today on Twitter about this. Here's a general rule. I'll tell it to you right now. General rule for me to all the followers. I love the fans. I love the followers. But here's a general rule. If you are going to respond to my tweet about this show, about an upcoming lineup, about today's lineup, Monday's lineup, if you're going to respond to the tweet and keep everyone tagged in the tweet and say something negative about a guest, either bad lineup, bad whatever, anything negative, and it's just a BS, obnoxious, a-hole comment, weak lineup, bro, oh, what is this, the C, like anything like that, you know what I'm talking about? It's instant block for life. Don't come crawling back like you usually do in my DMs. Don't do that. It's instant block for life. I will not let anyone tweet about my show with the guest tagged, which is what you morons do, and 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 there'll be no repercussions. You're blocked for life. And if you don't care about that, great. Go watch someone else's Jabroni show. I don't care. Go watch two guys in their bedrooms do a show. I don't give a crap. But you're not going to stick around here in my orbit. I'm not. It's hard enough to book this show and to get the names that we get. We had freaking Mark Coleman on today's show. We had freaking Action Bronson, Lauren Murphy fighting for a title fight. We, we have freaking Alexander Rakich fighting Richard Schaefer. Have some damn respect. If you are going to respond to one of my tweets about this show with the guest tagged in it, I want you to know right now you are getting blocked for life. And don't come back and crawl and cry and say, oh, you know, I'm such a fan. I didn't know what I'm going to. Blocked for life. That's the one thing I will not stomach. It's the one thing I won't tolerate. I freaking hate it. It drives me nuts. And quite frankly, it's what it's what I it's what made me hate this show so much three years ago. Why I wanted to stop doing it. It's because of people like you guys. And I know you're trolls and I know you're losers. And I know you you you're 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 you know, whatever, and 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 I shouldn't pay attention. And that's the internet. You could say what again, you can say whatever you want about me and the show, but if you're going to tag the guests in it, you're getting blocked. Just want to let you know. Just untag them, and then I'll keep you around. But if you're going to keep the guests tagged, you're getting blocked. I just want to let you know that. Anyway, okay, last last time I'm bringing that up. 185, I don't think it's a big deal. I think Diaz obviously didn't want to cut to 170, and uh, it's the Diaz world that we're living in, and so that's that. I don't think it's a huge deal. In fact, I don't even know if the line has changed as a result of this news coming out. Let's take a quick gander here. Um... Maybe it will change a little bit. I was curious. I don't think it has changed. No, still minus 110. There you go. Ariel, happy Wednesday. First off, have you heard anything from the John Jones camp about when you'd like to get back in the octagon? Go listen to my Richard Schaefer interview. It's all there. It sounds like in the... Uh... In the summer. Second, if both Poirier and Usman win their title fights this year, assuming Olivera Poirier fight does take place in December, who would you give the edge to in the fighter of the year race? Wow. And lastly, any closer to the Diaz Luque fight? No, not closer to Diaz Luque at all. Fighter of the year, man, that would be 3 0 for both guys, right? Usman will be, oh, God, that would be really tough. Usman will have wins over Burns, Masvidal, Covington. Poirier would have McGregor 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 McGregor, 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 and uh, Oliveira. I might have to give it to Usman only because it's three different people. I don't know if that's fair, but damn, that would be a tough one. That would be really tough. Great question. Uh, probably Usman. Question I've had for years. Did Nick Diaz ever get compensation royalty for the infamous Joe Rogan podcast all day, all night that has been used in 1700 plus episodes and for 12 plus years. I don't know. I'm going to say I don't think so, but I honestly don't know. I can't, I can't answer. Uh, hey, Ariel, I'm a huge fan of your work and a brand new subscriber. When is the UFC going to stop using the Apex for fight nights? At the start of pandemic, Dana said repeatedly that the UFC would be going back to full capacity before everyone else, but we've had full crowds. Um, it seems like another example of the UFC screwing over the fighters and the fans. They can make as much profit as possible. Look, it does benefit them it does um make sense financially to stick around there i would suspect by next year we'll start to see fight nights outside we're not going to see them outside of the apex for the rest of the year i suspect by next year from what i'm hearing but i also think that there will be some still at the apex it just makes all the sense in the world for them financially i mean to have that fortune that luck 
because they, of course, didn't know the pandemic was coming, to build that thing and to have it ready to go for the pandemic. I mean, had Nevada not completely shut down, all the events would have been there and they would have been freaking sitting pretty. Um, but they've saved a lot and it's been huge. In fact, they've made a lot as a result. Think about it. They don't have to travel all around, set up shop, production, hotel. It's all there. They have a hotel across the street. It's all there. It's a dream for them. But I do think that Dana wants to get out and I do think he understands the value of getting out. Um, I just think, you know, at this point, rest of the year, they're going to ride it out. I think they have a deal with the, uh, the hotel nearby. Um, and then in 2022, they will start to get back out there. It does make the pay-per-views feel a little more special. The fact that they're not the Apex, because I have to say the Apex, like, it, it, it's hard to get up for some of those, especially the prelims at the Apex. Um, Luis, What's your favorite live crowd pop reaction? You could choose from one you experience in person or on TV. Oh man, that's hard. That is hard. Um, God. Hulk Hogan, standing ovation Montreal after WrestleMania 18 was pretty amazing. I mean, I've 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 had the uh, the fortune of being at a lot of these. Um, one of my favorites actually was being at Champ Sports Bar in Montreal when GSP fought Matt Hughes, UFC 65. I have the picture right over there at the top of the uh, the screen on my right. Um, him finishing Matt Hughes, that was a great moment. Um, and the Sports Bar in Montreal just absolutely exploded. And that's really the night where I decided, hey, you know, I want to do this for a living. Um, I just saw the the emotion. Oh, here's one from the guy. Uh, Luis, for me, wrestling is responsible for many I could think of, and there's one that I think you should check out, if not familiar, in Montreal, 2005, on Raw, building up to the SummerSlam match with Hogan. HBK was getting nuclear heat from the crowd. They then played Bret Hart's music, and the crowd blew the roof off. This was years before Bret actually returned, worth every minute of viewing time. All right, I'll check it out. Thank you. But there's been, a, I mean, Connor in Dublin was nuts when he beat Brandau. Uh, Mr. Helwani, you do a great job of remaining cool and collected in your interviews. Over the years, is there one interview that stands out as the most unsettling? Um, honestly, I mean, the, uh, the, where, the where I come from, people like you get slapped. Nate, and Nick didn't want to do the interview and told, I think Caesar was there. This is 2011 San Diego before a Strike Force event headlined by Nick Diaz and Paul Daly. And he's like, I'm not doing this interview. And then finally they got him to do it. And I could sense that he didn't really want to do it. And then he said that line and he said it with a smile. But then at one point he kind of got a little bit aggravated. And I was like, hmm, is this going to end badly? But I never truly felt like he was going to do anything. And I've never really felt anyone was going to do anything. So I'd probably say the mayhem one got a little bit weird in the studio when he was playing Lucky Patrick. That was probably the one where I thought it might get physical. Ariel, my American brother, congrats. A couple questions today. I thought your interview with Ryan Cavanaugh was really fascinating it seemed to provide a lot of thoughtful responses. Thank you. Did any of your opinions on Triller change post-interview? Not really. I mean, they still want to promote De La Hoya and Vitor and Evander. Like, I don't know. I don't think that that's a sustainable um, business model. Also, just randomly changing the date of that Teofimo Lopez fight for what feels like the fifth time seems strange to me. Um, so... I appreciate him coming on and his responses, but I don't know if my opinion of Triller changed dramatically. Uh, thoughts on Connor's epic first pitch at the Cubs game. Appreciate you, my friend. Yeah, that wasn't great. Look, when I saw that, someone asked me, rate Connor's athletic endeavors. Uh, we've seen him shoot a basketball at MSG. We've seen him throw a football at uh, Cowboy Stadium. We've th seen him now throw out the first pitch at Wrigley Field. I put the football one as the worst because, you know, anyone could kind of throw a football. There's no real target that you have to, I mean, it's just like more the mechanic and that one seems a little bit crazy. Also, I mean, not for nothing. He's wearing a suit. It's a little, it's tough when you're wearing a tight suit. The baseball one I've heard, I mean, a lot of people have messed it up. Luke Rockhold, shout out to Jedi Goodman, posted this yesterday. Luke Rockhold nailed it. I guess it was at an A's game. I don't remember this one, but he threw an absolute, I mean, strike down the middle. Beautiful. Um, but I've heard top of the mound. It's a little tough. Pressure's on. You're not practicing. It's not your thing. Tight suit. Not great. 
But when I saw him do that, I thought, all right, there's two ways this can go. He could either run away from it, not his style, or just kind of make light of it. And he made light of it. And that's the perfect way to disarm everyone. You can't hide from something like that. So everyone's getting a good laugh at his expense. When you're such a confident fellow, you put yourself out there, you stick your 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 your, your chest out, you know, people are gonna come after you. Um, and people are getting a good laugh at his expense, but I think he's doing just fine. And yeah, I mean, Casey's telling me he made the basket, but the form wasn't great. Let's be honest. The form was great, but he did make the basket. So I went football, baseball, basketball uh, as my top three in terms of the athletic prowess, what we've seen from him. Um, Don, who is your high school best friend and where is he slash she now? My high school best friend was uh, Mo Liebman, and he's still one of my closest friends, and he's in Montreal, and I spoke to him today. And I had another best friend named uh, Daniel Wolf, and he is still in Montreal, and I spoke to him yesterday. So we're all good. Life is good. They're still my two best friends. How about that? Uh, are you a part of the Nick Diaz Army? Unofficial member? I don't know. Oh, here's uh, another one from Don. It's your boy Don Black with another three-peat of questions. First question, have you ever met Kobe Bryant? Unfortunately, I didn't. I saw him at the uh, the Body Armor press conference. By the way, one of the staples of doing this show back in the day, I always used to have a Body Armor here below my desk, but we don't have the stash anymore. So if my friends at Body Armor want to hook me up on the house, I would appreciate it. Uh, he was there at the presser at MSG, but I never met him. Unfortunately, may he rest in peace. Um, TS61, I don't understand how Leon thinks he's entitled to a title shot. Some things people don't talk about. One blatant eye poke to Bilal. Didn't do it on purpose. Get out of here with the blatant. Didn't do it on purpose. Didn't give him a rematch? Ah, more on the UFC. They went with the Diaz fight. He was winning the fight. But yeah, I mean, Bilal has a case there. Fine. Uh, two, he didn't try to finish Diaz at all in their fight? Get out of here. It's Nate freaking Diaz. Been finished once. Imagine the buzz if he becomes one of the only people. Yeah, I'm sure he tried. I don't think he was coasting there. In my opinion, these two things... He should have considered. Your thoughts. Hogwash. I'm sure you tried. Ariel, what is going on with Zabit Magomed Sharipov? After the fight with Yir got canceled, we kind of stopped hearing about him. Yeah, the the word is he's kind of paused his career. I don't know. It's crazy. So much so much uh promise, so much talent. Great fighter, great style, exciting style. But it it, it looks like he's paused his career. Is it done? We don't know, but for now it looks like he's paused his career. Uh, David, the proposed format of the new WFL is intriguing. In a hypothetical scenario where all the current MMA gyms becomes teams in this kind of format, including all of their current fighters, which gym do you think would start as the favorite to win the league? Wow. American top team, probably. They got the, they got the female goat. They have Joanna there. They've got Masvidal. They've got, uh, Dustin. I mean, they got Kayla. Um, they've got some big boys, probably American top team right now, I would say. In boxing, the refs wear bow ties. If you had to pick a fancy item of clothing for the refs to wear, what would it be? I like the bow tie. I like it. I don't hate it. I don't mind the bow tie. Uh, bakery. Hot take. The orange julep is kind of overrated. Are you insane? It's one of the all time great drinks I've ever had in my life. Dare I say top five? It gets that iconic. I get that it's iconic in our city, but the drink there is definitely overhyped. Cheers again for Montreal. What the hell is wrong with you? No, that is not true. If you're ever in Montreal, go to Dakari Expressway. Actually, like a stone's throw from TriStar, go to a big julep establishment. It looks like a massive orange. It's like with a sign, it says orange julep huge orange, like a gigantic orange, and try their drink. Now, GSP is the only person I know that has the spaghetti with meat sauce. I have never had the spaghetti with meat sauce. I would not vouch spaghetti with meat sauce to be ordered. I'm more of a julep, maybe a grilled cheese guy, um, but the julep is phenomenal. Is Nick Diaz just playing fight week mind games with Robbie Lawler? A lot of things are not adding up with the information coming out at the beginning of the week. Nick Diaz looks like he's able to cut the 171. How do you know that? 
Can you confirm both fighters have agreed to fight at 185? Yes. Um, this guy doesn't seem to like Josh Thompson. I'm not going to say how he spelled his name. Um, knows better than to, Josh knows better than to speak on an outright rot, lie in the interview uh, by saying there's footage out there of Nick Diaz all over the internet. I haven't seen that footage. I know Cesar Gracie responded to the footage. I don't know about all that nonsense. Listen, I'm not the kind of guy to talk about people getting knocked out before fights and all this stuff. Like what happens in sparring, unless the fighter comes out and talks about it, you'd be surprised the kind of stuff that happens there. I don't think it's on us to unearth this. There's a sort of code that I think most people want to live by. And what happens in those sparring matchups are uh, pretty, you know, tightly kept. Uh, I'm surprised that a former fighter would just come out and, say that to the world and, and Caesar Gracie seems to have uh, refuted it. So I don't know. Again, I just hope he's okay. Has he, has he showed up? I'm looking, I'm looking at the feed. It doesn't look like he showed up. Um, also, are you going to have an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with the man himself? No, it's too tough at this point. Uh, hi again, Ariel. As a journalist, do you feel like you are competing with other journalists to try to break a story first? Is there a competitive aspect to being an MMA journalist or does that not really matter? I mean, yeah, of course. You want to break news first. Um, luckily, I, I, you know, I feel a competition in terms of the interviews. Um, I want to get the, you know, the exclusive with so-and-so. I want to talk to this person first. Like, there, there's definitely competition there. Um, competition with myself, with others. Some people like it, some people don't. I still feel like we could all work together. I still feel like we could all be cordial. Um, when I was working at ESPN, they really tried to to hurt me by giving fight news to other journalists to try to diminish my worth and and and, and, and my um, you know my reach or my power, whatever you want to say. I th I always thought that was laughable. They would literally tell managers. If you say this to Ariel, if Ariel breaks this, we're coming back to you. Like, no problem with anyone, but for some reason, God forbid, I break this news, you know, all hell breaks loose. And usually what they had was like a tweet. They had no big announcement, no big rollout, no big PR tour. It was just like a tweet, if that. Uh, but God forbid Ariel broke it. Um, never bothered me. In fact, my boss would always tell me that he didn't care if I broke news or not. It wasn't why they, they wanted to be in business with me. So I don't do it as much. I used to be obsessive over it in my early days. Um, but I don't feel like there's much of a payoff. And, uh, honestly, everyone's so afraid that it's just not fun. Um, so I worry more about the shows, the content, the interviews, the writing, all that stuff, and I'm happy. If if it means so much to them, I'll give them that. If it means so much to them that I don't break the news, here you go. You can have it. Now, if things fall in my lap or I'm, you know, I'm talking to people all day, but, you know, to beg to break some, you know, random fight on a random upcoming card isn't isn't worth it, doesn't interest me, and I just think it's 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 hilarious that they think that they're hurting me by feeding this to other media members that they love for whatever reason. It's hilarious. Like they would literally do this. A fight gets verbally agreed to and run like run literally and figuratively to tell other people. So it doesn't get to me. I mean, the, the real estate is just amazing. The free real estate is just amazing. I don't care. I really don't care. God bless. I'll do a show about it. It will probably get more attention than the actual news that, you know, will be forgotten about who broke it a day later. The pettiness knows no bounds. Silly. Uh, Scott from Portland. Ariel, congratulations on becoming a legal U.S. citizen. Not 100% yet. I feel like I have to keep saying that. Glad to have you officially on our roster. Uh, is it true when applying for your original U.S. green card, you use Mayhem Miller as a character reference? It wasn't a character reference. Um, people within my field had to write a letter on on uh, my behalf and one of those people was mayhem miller yes that is true i don't know if it was character reference maybe it was but uh i don't know but yes i mean technically you're right yeah we were tight and i wish him the best and it breaks my heart to see you know what's happened 
as of late yet again it's it's really unfortunate dear mr hiawani fast fire wrestling questions wcw wwf wwf all day hollywood hogan hulk hogan hmm i'll go hollywood more fun but i grew up uh you know in the hogan era so but Ho hollywood was more fun nwo dx I was I was more of a uh, of a WWF attitude guy, so I'll go DX. And the problem with NWO was they watered it down. They added too many members. Mister Heelwani versus the Schmo. I mean, come on. I mean, you're talking about the main event versus a curtain jerker. Come on. Better questions. What's your favorite finishing move? Oh, uh, the sharpshooter, Bret Hart. Top three best trash talker. Wrestling. I mean, Rock's up there. Stone Cold's up there. Trash talk. Rock, Stone Cold. Who else? Probably forgetting someone. Uh, one more thing. Can you please have the Honorable Sensei Seagal back on the show? Hard to get. Gone a little bit out there. But for you, I'll try. Peace, I'm out of here. By the way, you know why I say peace, I'm out of here? That's because of Billy Madison. I said that in college back in the day when I did my show, the, uh, the main event. I would end the show, peace, I'm out of here. Billy Madison that scene where he's like, nib high football rules, peace, I'm out of here at the graduation. That's why I say peace, I'm out of here. Little known fact. This week's edition of Where the Hell Is. So Ariel, where the hell is Crone Gracie? I don't know. I need to find out. People keep asking me about him. I don't know. Uh, Good day, Ariel. Have you ever measured your nose? No. Have you trained any form of martial art? Yes. I used to do a little jujitsu, a little Muay Thai. And then for the year before the pandemic, I was doing boxing three times a week near my house and then the pandemic and I haven't gone back. So I felt a little bit weird about being so close to other people, but I was really loving it. I was really enjoying boxing a lot. Uh, do you have any communication with Habib even privately these days? No. Also Rogan, could you ever see yourself on his podcast or him on your show? Probably not. Or did Dana ruin my dream? Probably not. I'm down. I have no issues. Um, with him coming on, if he wants to, I don't know if I want to go to Austin or anything like that, but, uh, whatever, you know, I always had love for Rogan. I didn't like that. He, uh, he lied about my situation. Other than that, I'm, you know, over it. Um, until people parroted and repeated five years later. Um, and also no beef with Habib either. I had heard through the grapevine that there's no beef, but he's kind of, you know, siding with his team, if you will, um, or his guy, but. I have no problems with him, but no, to answer the question directly, no communication with him. Thoughts on Sean O'Malley finishing his current contract with a very reputable, albeit unranked fighter in Brian Kelleher. I heard that's not 100%. Uh, and also, he has three fights left. So, he's not finishing it with him. Mr. Hilwani, can I just say, what a great job you do with the MMA hour. Thank you. Loving the new free Ariel. Thank you. Comes across like a weight has been lifted and you seem happier with life. Thank you. Can I just ask about the Shab situation as it's gone very quiet? Has he apologized again privately, or has there been anything slightly more silly? Keep up the good work with Substack BT. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And of course, uh, the seat you're sat in. Oh, thank you. Um, no, I have not heard anything else. I will say this, because people keep asking me. On that last show, I think it was like two Wednesdays ago, or maybe three Wednesdays ago, when I talked about Brian and the sensitive comment and all that stuff, maybe an hour later... I got a text and then a phone call from Brian Callen, and I've never talked to him privately before. He apologized profusely. He said he wanted no part of this. He said that he was going to rectify this. In fact, his exact words were he was going to go on their show on Monday, clear the air once and for all, rectify this, clear the air about 199, about the stuff that was said about me, apologize. Doesn't want any drama. It was a nice conversation. And my response to that was, great. I can't, hear, I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to hear what you're going to say on Monday. Nothing was said on Monday. And so, again, goes back to what I was saying earlier. Fake, phony. Tells me what I want to hear. Maybe is worried that I'm going to say more about something. I don't know. I don't know why he called. I don't know why he texted if he wasn't going to do anything about it. And he said nothing. I wish he would have never reached out. Why tell me you're going to do something? If you're not going to do it again, the part that they don't seem to get is you could be nice to me all you want behind the scenes. Don't go out and be fake on camera. I got to say, Big John does the same thing. 
nice to me behind the scenes. I never said anything about Big John. Then he goes on a show and he talks smack about me. I don't get it. What What's this new thing of being nice to people behind the scenes and then getting all tough on your show and 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 not like criticizing in a fair way. It's like unfair pot shots, talking about people's character, lying about them. That's the part I don't get. Like, of course, you're going to talk about this, that. Oh, that was a good interview. That was a bad fight. That was that's fine. That's all fair game. I get that. But like the other stuff, the pot shots is bizarre. So no, to answer your question, nothing else has happened. And I'm over it. I'm done. I'm moving on. As I told you, I was moving on from the beginning. I had to get it off my chest, but I'm moving on. Any updates on Nganu Gan? I mean, you heard it from Richard uh, Schaefer, January. Uh, hey, Ariel, a couple more here. Uh, this is uh, Jake from the Windy City. Congrats. Thank you. Um, why not space out the title fights, he's asking. It's a good question. They want to put two here. Maybe one isn't enough. But yeah, it's a good question. You got 13 pay-per-views. So um, I don't know. That's a Dana question. When are you getting your YouTube channel back off the ground? Coming very soon. Would love to see you interview Jason Agnew, Renee Paquette, Dave Meltzer. Great ones. I'll do that. Are you going to Arthur Ashe Stadium tonight for Dynamite? I am not, but I will be watching. It's a great card. Uh, Daniel Bryan, Kenny Omega. I love what they are doing. Adam Cole's entrance last week was great. MJF's promo was fantastic. I mean, it's a fun time. It's an absolute fun time. Also, I know you're a follower of sports media. It's clear cut that NBA on TNT is the best sports show on television. I agree. The chemistry with EJ, Kenny, Shaq, and Chuck is phenomenal. I agree. Do you think TNT would be able to replicate that with their NHL coverage with Wayne Gretzky? I don't think so. That's 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 going to be an interesting one to watch. Wayne isn't that kind of personality. I'm excited to see what Turner and ESPN do with their hockey coverage, but I don't think so. I really don't. I don't know if it's the right personalities. Let's see. Uh, what is the best card on paper so far this year? 259, 261, or 266? I have to only choose from those three? Oh, so far? I gotta be honest, I'm getting old. I don't even remember what 259 was. What was 259? March 6th, that was great. 261 was uh, Jacksonville, right? I'll go with... Ja Jacksonville was pretty great. Those last three fights were great. Shevchenko... Nami Yunus, Kamar Usman. I'll go with that one. Hey, Ariel. Hope you're having a great National Girls' Night in... What? Hope you're having a great National Girls' Night in day. Oh, like Girls' Stay In? Cool. Non-MMA question. What are your top three favorite countries outside of North America? For me, it's got to be Japan, South Korea, and Belgium. I wish I'd been to uh, South Korea. I've never been there. I've been to Japan. Cheers, dude. Congrats. Um, thank you. I'll go with Japan. I love Japan, Australia. Can I? Oh, outside of North America. Japan, Australia, Ireland was great. England was great. Japan, Australia, and UK and Ireland. How about that? Uh, Ariel, my G, started my MMA tenure as a wee novice and grew my love for the sport through your journalism and never say never attitude towards your work. Thank you. Uh, sending you much love from Atlanta. Question, how well... Would the reception be if Ministry of Darkness era Undertaker was introduced into the current era of wrestling? I don't know. I like that the current era of wrestling is like more real, less cartoony. Longtime fan, Ariel. This is from Matthew. I tune in weekly. My question is, I know you and Ali don't see eye to eye, but as a longtime fan, I'd love to get this figured out. Great. Let's get it figured out. No problems here. Also, I hope I don't get in trouble for saying his name. Um... Has too much happened? No. I, I'm over it. I don't care about this nonsense. This whole thing's dumb. Dumb, dumb, dumb. But again, I'm fine. I'm fine, as Floyd Mayweather once said. I'm fine. P.S. Give Gotta Said, Gotta Get Said podcast a listen. Cheap plug. All right. Gotta Get Said. Ariel, would you allow Fan to do a sit-down interview with you? A serious one-on-one? -on -one? Sure. I mean, isn't that what this is? Uh, Ariel, a couple questions. How did you decide what memorabilia is behind you? I picked some photos that meant a lot to me, some fights, GSP, Weidman, Nate Diaz, guys who were kind to me throughout my career, guys who I like, and just random stuff that I collected over the years. Any chance, Chaler DC? We'll see. Any chance of getting Joe B to come on the show? I don't think Joe B likes me very much. Um, I, I, think, I think his wife doesn't like me very much. I don't know why. Um, his wife uh, 
never followed his wife, never interacted with his wife on social media, yet she's blocked me everywhere. I, I, uh, I learned that not that long ago. So I don't know what the deal is. He used to come on the show all the time. Um, I don't think we do the same thing. I, I, I don't know if there's a professional rivalry. I think she thinks that I didn't let, I don't know. A lot, a lot of weird stuff goes on in the TV biz and the, in the media biz. Um, as I've said a thousand times, I just want to do the best that I can do and go home to my family and that's it. And so I have a lot of respect and admiration for Joe B. They said a couple things on a podcast once about me. And again, high road, Helwani, water off my back. Not that guy. I think the blocking thing is just bizarre. Um, I don't know if they're trying to side with anyone in this battle against me, but I'm good. I'm Gucci. No hate here. So yes, I would love to have Joe on uh, the show, and I don't know what that beef is all about. A lot of beefs out there. Okay, just a couple more. Um, Leon Edwards, best path to a title. Fight on November 6th. Win that fight, and you got it. Frank, hope you're having a good week. Big fan. And I want to say as a Franco poet from Sherbrooke, Quebec, I feel like your writing is improving, and I'm starting to see your style blooming in your writing. Wow, thanks. I appreciate that. I never thought that my writing was that good. Hope you're keeping... I uh, hope you're going to keep writing, and for sure I'm going to buy your first book. Hi, Rota Hiawani. Is there a book, maybe fiction, poetry, theater, that influenced you in your life? Not really. I'm sorry to say. Your show made me discover the poem If by Rudyard Kipling that I still go read when I need a boost. Thanks, and good world rhino day to you. I love you guys. Much love. Man, you guys are the best. This is what I want to focus on. Not the losers online. Please. Positivity. First off, two more. Congratulations on passing your U.S. citizenship test. Thank you. I was wondering if there's any way to see a way where you repair your relationship with Dana White. Lord have mercy on our souls. I see earlier videos of both of you on YouTube. There's a genuine friendship and respect. You both are great. I'm still hoping. You and me both, Bubba. I'll fly to Las Vegas right now extend my right hand and say put it here partner put it here the whole thing is dumb if you ask dana white right now what the beef is i'm, I'm sure he'll say to you he's a scumbag he's a douche he's this or that but there'll be no actual substance to the beef the fact that this thing has dragged on as long as it has is actually quite amazing um but again gucci i'm gucci main i'm happy all is good. No drama. Uh, last one. Helwani, what's your favorite Halloween movie? And did you dress up with your kids for the holiday? Or do you dress up with your kids for the holiday? I do. I'm looking forward to that. I wasn't a big Halloween movie guy. Chucky was cool. Never liked scary movies. My wife and I have a uh, three and one year old and are trying to think of cool family costume theme. We never did the family costume. We, uh, we always did, you know, one kid's going to dress up as... A bunny, another kid's going to dress up as a Minecraft character. We never did the whole family thing. We never got into it like that. I was never a big dresser-upper as a kid. I'd be the guy who'd put on a jersey and say, hey, I'm Patrick Ewing. Uh, but I do love Halloween. Love the candy. Love the, the vibe. Love the holiday. Love the decorations. Like the spooky shit. I used to love the Simpsons Halloween specials. Those were fun. Uh, but I was just not a big dresser-upper. All right. Thanks for all the questions, guys. I love, I, I, you know, I love all the questions about the career. I love the positive feedback. I know that you guys get all, uh, you get all excited about the tea. I'm not here to spill tea. I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just living my life and, uh, not worried about, um, you know, playing politics, just telling it like it is, like the great Howard Cosell once said. And so it's great to answer these questions and I look forward to doing it every Wednesday. For now, though, before we go, we got to get picks from our guy Connor. Now, Jedi Goodman has dubbed him Georgia Connor. I'm really the nickname guy around here with all due respect, Jedi. I mean, you do great work for me and, and you clip off the stuff. And I mean, I love you like a brother, but I mean, I'm the nickname guy around here. All right. I come up with the nickname. So I don't know if I'm 100% sold on GC. GC's not bad, Georgia Connor. Um, in any event, let's go to uh, the control room now because I believe Connor is standing by, newest member of our team, uh, and I believe he has some picks for us. Is he there? Can you hear me? Oh, there you are. There we go. Okay, it was a bit of a delayed uh, reveal there. And by the way, uh, I failed to mention this last week, Connor. I don't know if you know this. Uh, I'm a big historian, so I like to give you know respect to the past. You know, 
the, the the other guy who used to sit in that chair for many years is a is a is a person who's very near and dear to my heart. New York Rick, are you familiar with New York Rick? Do you know about the legend that is New York Rick? I've become familiar with him through the start of this. I don't know it's on about. Wow. Yeah. I mean, is, is there beef there or what? No, nah, nah, no, no beef. beef with New York Rick. You never cross paths with him at ESPN because he's now at ESPN, as you know. I had no idea. No, you didn't know he's at ESPN. No, I had no, I had no clue. Uh, he's the, the, the sort of brains behind the ESPN MMA, uh, social handles, the Instagram, the Twitter, him and a young woman, lovely young woman named, uh, Tessa. Wow. Yeah. So how about that? Yeah. Small world. Yeah. So when I left, he was like, you know what? Hiwani, I'm coming with you. That's the kind of loyalty that I breed. So you may not know this, but now we're, you know, we're attached for life. Unless, you know, Greeny calls you up and you go take another job with, uh, with him on his show, be his co-host or something. Yeah, I don't think we got to worry about that. Okay, all right. We'll be all right. All right, we're good. Um, in any event, it kind of hit me after talking to you. I was like, I've never actually talked to anyone but him in that oh, chair. Wow. So it was, uh, it was a wild experience. But it's great to have you here. People are excited about your picks. And so without further ado, I've done enough talking for the day. What do we got? UFC 266 this Saturday, pay-per-view, ESPN+. Plus. What are the picks? UFC 266. We got a pay-per-view here. Couldn't be more excited. I got five plays for you, five single plays. We got a couple uh, couple underdogs, Just a little sprinkle we're going to get going. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got the parlay that you ordered. We will have the parlay. So let's kick it off. Let's start in the early prelims. You know, you still probably got football on the main TV. You, yep. got, you got the the fights on the side TV at this point, maybe still on mute. Let's unmute it for this one. We're going with the third fight, middleweight. Nicholas Maximov, I'm going to take him at minus 110 against Carl Roberson. Maximov fighting out of the Nick Diaz Academy. Got to be a big night for him fighting on the same card as Nick. How does Nick Maximov win? Mm. By submission. Okay. He's a regular on submission underground cards. Half his pro wins come by submissions. How does Carl Roberson lose? By submission. All four of his pro losses are coming by subs. The experience gap worries me a little bit. I know Roberson's fought guys like Marvin Vittori, Glover Teixeira, but he's lost four of his last seven fights with the beneficial matchup. Four... Maximov coming at almost even odds. I'm going to be taking Maximov here. Okay. Well, this is great insight. I thought you were just going to come and say, hey, Maximov here. Got a little uh, hooker there. You're, you've actually done a deep dive on these guys. You've done I mean, your work. I'm not going to make a play without doing the research here, man. This is good stuff. And, yes, I mean, great call. Maximov fighting on the same card as uh, the patriarch of the NDA team, Nick Diaz Academy. So, okay, so the play is just Maximov. Are, are we saying how much we're putting, or is that just up to the people? It doesn't really matter, right? I mean, yeah, we're not we're not going to shame on how much you're going to put on this. I guess we'll we'll, we'll call it a unit. A unit. I know that's uh, yep. you know that's a questionable term by some gamblers, but uh, we'll call it a unit. So I'm putting it to win a unit on Maximov at minus one ten. Okay, I like that. What else you got? All right, we're sticking with the early prelims here. It's the final card on this one, lightweight bout. Uros Medic going against Jalen Turner. So I'm going to take this one. Does not go the distance okay. at minus 185. Ten of Jalen's last 11 fights have not gone the distance. Euros, he's never gone the distance in any of his seven professional fights. Of their combined, 22 pro fights. Only two of them have ever gone the distance. If you're doing the math at home, that's 91% of the time it does not go the distance. Of the 20 that didn't, only one of those, only one. Made it to the third round. I do not see this one going to a decision. At 91% of the time for them, at minus 185, I will take that juice all day long. Okay, so it doesn't matter who wins. Doesn't matter who wins. It's just got to be before the 15 minutes. Okay, so now let me ask you this. That was minus 185, and you said that uh, Maximov was what, minus 105, 110? Minus 110. Now, both of those are considered favorites, right? The minus? Yes, correct. So, like, Maximov and Carl Roberson, when I took it, they were both at minus 110. You got to uh, pay the juice gotcha. to the juice man in Vegas. Yes. You're never just going to get the even <laughs> odds. Right. So we got we had to take that one at minus 110. Minus 185, that is more of a heavy favorite, but I feel confident in that pick, so I'm willing to pay for the juice for it. Side note, did you run the New York City Marathon? Oh, did you see that? Wow. You see that right Look there? at you, just like I don't want to. I don't want to brag or anything. I mean, it's but, right uh, there in my face. I mean. Is that the last yeah. one? That is the last one that happened. Is yep. it coming back this November? It is coming back. I will not be participating. I will probably never do a marathon again. It was extremely difficult. Uh, what was difficult? The actual act of running or the aftermath? Both. Both. Uh, yeah, I blew my knee out pretty hard. Oh, during, no. Uh, yeah, during training. And, uh, and you stuck with it. Stuck with it. I walked pretty much the last half of the marathon. Uh, I was too scared to stop. 
because I stopped once, and then when I started going again, it felt like my whole knee exploded. So, yeah, I was too scared to stop. Didn't stop at the bathroom, anything like that. All the way through. It took me five hours, but... Uh, wow. Got through it. I got the medal, man. That's that's all that matters. How many marathons jacket. have you done? One. That was it? One and done. What that's what prompted you to do this? Uh, one of my coworkers was doing it, and, uh, you know, I've run my whole life. And, uh, so you're a big was, runner? Uh, formerly. Formerly. I, I was a big runner. Now, uh, you know, I'm sidelined. I did I did my marathon, and I'm done. No, but, like, were you a runner in high school? Like, what do you mean? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I ran, I ran... I ran track. I ran cross country. I did all that. Okay. Wow. All right. Yeah. I couldn't play the real sports, you know. No, no. I get it. I mean, I used to play basketball. It's, it's, it's all the same. Um, all right. Back to the picks. All right. Back to the picks. Let's get to the prelims. You mentioned I'm from Georgia. Yes. I've got a fellow Georgian on this card. And us Georgia boys, Wait. we've got to look out for Okay. You. Yeah. <laughs> I see where you're going with this. My man, Marad Devalishvili. Yeah, all right. Fair you know you, I was you going claim, You claim Georgia the country as well. Country, state. Yeah, it's all the Georgia boy. Yeah. I mean, that's all I know. Fair enough. So I'm going to take him. But that's Five. another favorite. Oh, wait. Go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. All right. All right. All right. See, he's a, he's a heavy favorite. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take him by decision over Marlon Marias at plus 110. So this is actually a plus money play here. Oh. Marab by decision is, is, is a plus 110. That's actually surprising to me. It's actually on the move. So I've actually already locked it in at plus 110. I've seen it even at some books. I've seen it at minus 110 at some books as well. Okay. So... They call Marav the machine. They should be calling this guy the decision maker. He lost his first two UFC fights. He's on a six-fight win streak. All of those wins coming by decision. Mm-hmm. I think these are two fighters going in the opposite direction. Marias, he's lost three of his last four. Don't get me wrong. I still think he's incredibly dangerous. You know, he's KO'd Aljamain. He had the split decision with Aldo. He's faced Cejudo. He's got three first-round KOs in the UFC to his name. That's what makes me nervous. I think that first round is going to be a sweat. That's, that's, that's where we got to worry about Marav maybe getting KO'd. But from there, I think he's going to control it. He's going to take this one to the ground. All eight of his UFC fights have gone the 15 minutes. I know he had the, the Ricky Simon technical submission. That was that was a loss, but uh, it was a it still went 15 minutes. And in those 120 minutes that he's been in the octagon, he has had control time for 40 percent of that, 39.7 percent. That is good enough for third among all active bantamweights, and I think that's exactly Damn. what he's going to do here. He's going to take control. He's going to control it the entire time and cash us. Another decision one. Wow, look at this insight. All right, so we got decision. That's a, what, what do you say it was? A, a plus? Plus 110. Plus 110, okay. Yep, so we'll throw a unit down on that. We'll win, you know, we'll get 1.1 units coming back at plus 110. All right. All right, let's move on to the main card. Okay. Um, You know, this one, I don't have as much statistical analysis behind okay. it. Okay. Uh, this is more of an emotional Please play. Please say it's Lauren Murphy. No, listen, there's no real way to even have a statistical analysis of this one, you know. It's going to be Nick Diaz. Oh. Minus 105 against Robbie Lawler. Uh, you know, I, he obviously hasn't fought in almost seven years. Hasn't gotten a win in a decade. Robbie Lawler, you know, he's technically been the more active fighter, but he has lost five of his last six. Five rounds, theoretically, mm-hmm. I guess, should maybe be in benefit to Diaz, but there's really no way to know. And he was doing the triathlons. Uh, I really just want to be a party on this, part of the party on this one. I just want to have a play here. Uh, it's too cool that Nick Diaz is back in the ring. So, so you're I'll going with Nick. Run. I'm going with Nick at minus 105, and I'm going to add in a little party favor here, a little sprinkle here. So he's got he's got 13 pro wins by knockout. He's already knocked out Robbie Lawler in his career. 25 minutes, long time to go without a finish. So I'm going to sprinkle like a quarter of what I'm putting on Nick Diaz to win. Nick Diaz by KO, TKO, DQ at plus 500. Wow. Plus 500, yep. Wow. At any point, right? It doesn't matter what round. 25 minutes if he knocks Robbie Lawler out. We cash plus five. Oh, my word. Uh, an update, by the way, on Mr. Diaz from our good Let's friend Casey. Uh, he has, there are eyes on him in the building, but he has not actually gone to the podium just yet for the uh, the media days. So he is in the building, but not talking just yet to uh, the media. So perhaps it's going to coincide nicely with the conclusion of this program. Then people can watch uh, Nick Diaz do his first media day in quite some time. All right. I like that one. That I mean, a bit of a Hail Mary there, but I like it. A bit of a Hail Mary, and if it cashes, it's going to be a, a big, very cool yes. bet to watch cash. Yes. All right. Last one of the single plays. Let's get to the main event of the evening. Featherweights for the title. Oh. I'm going to take Alex Volkanovsky mm. at minus 165 over Brian Ortega. Statistically speaking, Volkanovsky has the edge in almost every single category. Significant strikes landed per minute, striking accuracy, striking defense. And, uh, you know, despite Ortega being a GJJ master, he's got higher takedown percentage, higher control time, better takedown percentage. 
Uh, he's 9-0 in the UFC, and uh, he hasn't lost a fight since May of 2013. Uh, and he beat the man that handed Ortega his only loss twice in Max Holloway. However you feel about that one, however you feel about the last fight, yes. it doesn't matter. Polarizing. Volkanovski got the W. That's what happened. I had money on Volkanovski that night, and I can assure you oh. that the money hit the account. Wait, so, which one? Both or the second or the first? The second one. The second, second one. That was questionable even, one. That oh, was yeah. even more questionable. Yes, oh, man, yeah. I, uh, listen, the money hit the account. That's all I know. So Volkanovski won that one. Uh, so we've locked him here at minus 165. A uh, really interesting note. Less than a year ago, Korean Zombie closed at minus 185 against Ortega. I understand Ortega's. Wow. He's, he's improved. Uh, you know, I know he's still dangerous. He could take this one to the ground in it in any moment. But if I'm getting the champ, if I'm getting Alex the Great at a shorter price than the Korean Zombie, just one fight removed, I have to take it. So I'll be taking Volkanovski. Wow, yeah, people, I think, forget that Zombie was the uh, the favorite going into that fight. A fairly heavy favorite, yeah. too. And I also got an additional sprinkle here. About half of what I'm going to put on Volkanovski to win, I'm going to put on Volkanovski by decision at plus 120. I think if it goes to a decision, Volkanovski is going to get the win by decision because of all the statistical reasons that I just mentioned. It's minus 135 to go to a decision, so why not just take Volkanovski at plus 120 to win by decision if I feel that he's going to win that way. Okay, how about that? Now, I just want to note something, because you, you mentioned you bet on the uh, the second fight last July. You're not just doing this because of the show. Like You enjoy doing this, right? Like You'd be oh, doing okay. this regardless. This is your thing. Oh, this has been happening. Okay. This is whether I was coming on here tonight. The research okay. would have been put in the best. I love it. Play. I love it. And for all sports? Yes, yes. Yeah, number I one is not. college basketball. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'd say college basketball, soccer, UFC. Soccer, really? Yep. What kind yep. of EPL? Everything. Winner draw parlays are my thing in soccer. <laughs> baseball? Baseball's tough, no? Uh, I don't I don't really touch baseball. Football, NFL is just so difficult. They're so sharp in Vegas on the NFL. It makes it difficult. You kind of got to get to the markets where you got an edge. Tennis? Tennis. Yeah, so Jeez, make, Louise, make you are a degenerate gambler. Wow. All right. I, I mean, easy on the uh, all right. Sorry. Uh, what about uh, basketball? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I bet on basketball. No, like NBA. Not nearly as much as college yeah, basketball yeah, okay. now. No. And what about hockey? Oh, yeah. I love betting on hockey for playoffs, but that's more for fun okay. rather than, you know. What about college football? Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. As. as University of Georgia graduate, yes. Okay. College football Saturdays, I am I am placing my Have you ever been on pro wrestling? No. No, I actually didn't even know that you could bet some, on some some offer. I think DraftKings does, but not I think pro wrestling's a little weird because like what if you know a guy who's on the writing team? I, I think that's kind of weird. Anyway, all right. Um that's great. I love it. It's uh it's a fascinating world and it's obviously growing exponentially. Okay, so those are your picks, and now you have the parlay, right? The parlay, just what you ordered. Here it is, man. here it is, yeah. here it is. I mean, what doesn't spell a parlay. winner like a uh, UFC parlay? You know, what what could possibly go wrong? What are, are you are you implying that they're almost impossible to hit? No, they're not impossible to hit, but uh, they are they are difficult. Mm -hmm. They are more difficult than other sports, just with the uh, the wild and unpredictable nature. Anything can happen. You know, for example, Sean O'Malley when he uh, when he broke his leg. You know, I had him in quite a few parlays oh, that geez. night. So, you know, what are you gonna do? Yeah. Things happen. So let's do this. Four-legger here. Okay. We've got four legs of this one. We'll start with the early prelims. It's it's spread out across the whole night, so it'll be fun yes. if it keeps winning. We will start with Mac Matt Semmelsberger, minus 475, over Martin Sano. Sano, similar to Maximov, he's fighting on a Nick Diaz Academy, but in this case, I actually think that might have a lot to do with why he's in this fight and <laughs> making his UFC debut. I mean, dude, he hasn't fought since February of 2017, hasn't won since April of 2014. <laughs> Semmelsberger, he hasn't exactly had the toughest road in the UFC, but he's got that experience. I think this is a fight that he should win. Side note, you're 100% right. Uh, Spartan Sano is like a very good friend of uh, Nick. When they met with Dana a few months ago, he was, you know, he was in the room. He took the picture. Uh, a very good friend, and uh, this reminds me a little bit of Chris Avila and Nathan Diaz. When Diaz fought Connor, they had Avila fight Artem Lobov. Uh, sometimes when you've got the juice... You get your friends a shot, so you nailed it. I'm not trying to take anything away from the guy. You know, let's see what what he comes up with. But as far as his placement on the card, yes, it's in large part due to his relationship with Nick Diaz. We just have to be honest. Yeah, but let's let's not jinx us here. Okay, you know, sorry, sorry. Guy's been out of the game for four right. four years. You know, he could come out a beast. He could knock Semmelsberger out. Um, all right, let's keep it moving. Early prelims, like two. Manon Fiore minus two sixty over Myra Bueno Silva Fiore. 
Dropped her first pro fight, but she's now won seven straight. She's violent. She's aggressive. She's always moving forward. She actually throws and lands double the amount of significant strikes as Silva. She has finished six of her seven wins. I just think she's going to outclass Buena Silva here and get the win. I love it. Okay. These I mean, these aren't the I mean, like these are the hard ones to pick. These aren't the easy ones. So props to you. These are the uh, the under the radar fights on this We're card. Gonna We're going to see uh, come Saturday. All right, let's move to the main card. Like three. Jessica Andrade, minus 265 over Cynthia Cavillo. I am aware that Andrade has lost three of her last four fights, but they've all come to champs. Shevchenko, Rose, Wiley Zhang. And that one win during the rough patch uh, came against Caitlin uh, Chukagian, and uh, that is actually the last person that Cavillo fought, and she lost in that one. Andrade, she's got the experience against the best in the world. I think that's going to come to play here, and she's going to win a fight that she should win. Okay, I like that one. I like that one. Final one, main card, the other title fight, the co-main event. Mm. We will get Valentina. Oh, man. Shevchenko. Minus 1,500 is too much to pay. Yeah. Minus 1,500. We're only getting a couple dollars added to the parlay here. So we're going to take Valentina Shevchenko to win inside the distance at minus 250. To me, personally, big fan of Lauren Murphy coming on the show today, but I really don't think this is if Valentina wins. I think it's more about how. 21 wins in her career, 7 by sub, 7 by decision, 7 by KO. She can really do it all. I know Lauren Murphy has never been finished in her entire pro career, but I'm really not sure if she's faced an opponent like Valentina Shevchenko, nor has she ever gone the full five rounds, 25 minutes. So I think Valentina is going to be able to get this one inside the distance. Four legs, and that will pay out plus 223. Okay, now this is really interesting. I, I'm actually fascinated to hear your answer here. Uh, this was reported at 4.10 p.m. Eastern time, so 48 wow. minutes ago. The Manon Fioro fight is off due to COVID. Wow. Um, wow. And thank you to a couple of people who've reached out in the middle of this to tell me this, like literally right now. So what happens now? The fight is off. Let me hear what, uh, let me read, uh, will no longer happen. That was canceled Wednesday after Fioro, who is, <coughs> excuse me, asymptomatic and her team tested positive for COVID-19. This according to MMA Junkie uh, after an initial report by ESPN Deportes. So what happens? Breaking news. Yeah. Throw me off on the fly. Yeah. Yeah, so essentially I'll just get refunded for the parlay here and I'll have to. I uh, need my parlay. So will I'm you. Gonna f uh, listen, I'm going to find someone to replace it. Okay. Does it have to be I four got... fights on the parlay? No. The, no. Yeah. You, so why don't you just you do two? the same parlay without that fight? You feel like it's not enough juice? Let's do it. Let's. I mean, I had I had a couple backups. You okay. know, maybe I could rock with the fellow Georgian again. Yeah, that's you know, true. Double down on him. But I don't know if I want to ride that hard with him. Or I could add in a guy like Curtis Blades going against Rosenstruck. You know, he's he's going at like minus three ten. Uh, let's go with the three. Let's go with the three. Listen, let's no not, pressure. Let's not get switched up too much on the fly here. Let's go with the three. So you'll rebet that, right? What do they do? They did. They'll just cancel that one. You'll get your yeah, money. Yeah, you, yeah. you'll just get refunded back yeah. to your account. Interesting. Um, all right, so we'll go with that. Can you do me a favor? Uh, it's very hard for me to remember all this. Can you tweet this all out? Absolutely. I'm going to read to you, and then I will monitor this uh, on Saturday night. And, of course, on Monday, we will come back and see how you did. I feel like, you know, I feel like these are good picks. A little, you know, you took a couple flyers here and there. Uh, but overall, I feel pretty good about what you're about to accomplish here. Yeah, I'll tweet it out. I know it's a lot to keep up with. Uh, you know, follow along, trash talk me when they lose. Yes. We can all celebrate together if they win. What is, uh, oh, there it is. It's right there. Connor Burks, your Twitter handle. There it is. Right Very there. active. It's a lot of Atlanta sports tweets. Listen, I can tone down the Atlanta, yeah. the Atlanta sports. We could, uh, you know, maybe, you know, balance it out a little bit. Um, all right. So, I mean, I have to say, what a great showing. I mean, this is, you know, someone tweeted, who tweeted me this earlier? Oh, it was, uh, I don't mean to name drop here. Michael Carter Williams. I don't know if you're familiar with MCW. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, wow. Texted me this uh, just, uh, what, uh, eight minutes ago saying, I don't know what it is in reference to. Maybe the the Rakic interview? Yuri Prochaska has the most underrated debut in UFC history. Just out of the blue. That was the text. Uh, I would like to say this is a very impressive debut in MMA Hour history. We've had a lot of debuts. Wow. Not quite Conor McGregor's debut back in 2013, you know, the infamous Blueberry interview, which I'm sure you've seen many a time. But this is this is up there. This will live in the pantheon, especially if you go. Like, what would be a success here on Saturday? 80 percent, 85 percent. How would we gauge? We got, you know, we got seven plays and we got the parlay. So okay. let's go five and two in the parlay caches. That's that is a very successful night. If we have to take four and three parlay caches, that's successful as well. At the end of the day, as long as we're profiting. Yeah. 
were positive. That's that's really all that matters. And I got an update for you. Here. Oh, Semmelsberger, Andraj, Valentino Shevchenko by knockout. That'll be the parlay this week. That's going to pay out at plus one thirty three. A lot less juice, but wait, you, you know. just did that right now? I haven't placed it yet. I, no, I, I know, I but like you did the calculation of what the yeah. I mean, they do the calculation. For right, me. right. Yeah. No, I know, but I mean, I didn't know. I didn't see your your hands moving, so I didn't know if you actually like punched I mean, it all in. Just, that's that's the magic you get here with old uh that's ESP, that's there. espn radio right there i mean that's many years oh, yeah, that's I mean. <laughs> you don't learn to be on camera or radio for nothing that's true that is true all right my man well good luck to you i look forward to following along thank you for doing this again it's uh at connor c-o-n-n-e-r burks by the way what about that um ceremonial first pitch by connor mcgregor yeah, not great for the Connor Brewer. <laughs> uh, we're coming back though with this debut uh, this, this by after good, your yeah. rave reviews. Yes, uh, the Connor brand is it's getting strange. It's on the come up. It's on the come up. All right, my man. Thank you very much. Good luck to you. There he is, Connor Burks. Uh, kind enough to uh, weigh in. And by the way, uh, if you'd like to follow along, uh, if you'd like to follow along and and place your bets, make it happen. He's going to tweet them. I'll retweet them, and it could be a grand old time just like the old days. And so I look forward to that. Now, one last update. Has Nick Diaz showed up? Casey, tell me. Has Nick Diaz showed up? Jedi says he likes GC. So I think we're on board with that. Um, no, it doesn't look like it. Doesn't look like it. I don't see any tweets, so it doesn't look like he's there. All right. We have run out of time, my friends. Mysterious Frank, do you want to say anything about uh, the Zoom earlier? Do you want to tell the public what happened? Should we talk about it or should we forget about it? Yeah? I feel like, you know, let's, uh, let's address it. What happened? So Let's pull back the curtain. Break down the fourth wall. We're trying to get 10 minutes in with Lauren. Yeah. We- Wait, this is my fault? We were like, let's do, <laughs> let's do thirty at the end. Uh, it actually ended up better, right? Yeah, exactly. It was all by design. Okay, so that's really the reason. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I'm being honest, it made for a much better interview. So all's well that ends well. Everyone's happy. You can hit my music. It is time to go. UFC 266. Whenever you're ready with music, you know, you know, if you want me to stick around longer. Maybe the music just isn't going to play. I don't know. <laughs> Casey tells me no Nick Diaz yet. Dun, dun, dun. Dum, dum, dum. I think he'll show up. It's just a matter of when. And then if he shows up, what is he going to say? going to be interesting my friends it's always interesting when it's a nick diaz fight week isn't it and we haven't had one of these in six and a half years so let's see fun day on the program thank you very much to everyone who stopped by thank you to everyone who tuned in or is tuning in after the fact i appreciate you more than you know thank you to uh the great alexander rakic not to be confused with alexander Rakich, good luck to him as he attempts to get that Anthony Smith fight and just fight before the end of the year. I like the way he said it. He said, you know what? December 18th, let's go. Give me the main event or I'm out of here. I'm taking my bags back to Vienna. Thank you very much to Action Bronson. Check out his new book. Check out his block party in Williamsburg uh, later on this week on Saturday, to be exact, before UFC 266. Thank you very much to Mark Coleman. Congratulations to the Kevin Randleman family on the induction. Thank you very much to Richard Schaefer, and thank you very much to Lauren Murphy. Good luck to her on Saturday. Enjoy UFC 266. Enjoy all the fights. Back next week, same time and place. Until then, I say peace. I'm out of here.